City of Adelaide Council meeting on Tuesday, 24th of July, 2018. The Lord Mayor is in the chair. This council meeting is being streamed live and recorded for publishing to the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording is being taken of this meeting. This means that your presence at and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed, or published publicly to, by the council, including transferring outside of Australia. The red light to my right indicates that the meeting is being filmed and streamed. Council acknowledges that we are meeting on the traditional country of the Kaurna people of the Adelaide Plains. It pays respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge they are of continuing importance to the Kaurna people living today. And we also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations that are present today. Council acknowledges the vision of Colonel William Light in determining the site for Adelaide and the design of the city with its six squares and continuous surrounding belt, sorry, my mistake, and surrounding belt and continuous parklands, which is recognised on the National Heritage List as one of the greatest examples of Australia's planning heritage. Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask your blessing upon the works of the City of Adelaide. Direct and prosper its deliberations to the advancement of your glory and the true welfare of the people of this city. Amen. Will all present stand and remain standing in silence in memory of those who gave their lives in defence of their country at sea, on land and in the air. Members, ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. <laughs> Members, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Uh, City of Adelaide Council meeting, Tuesday 24th of July 2018. Members, I have provided permission for a photographer to be in the council chamber this evening to take photographs. Uh, members, can I please, item five in your agenda is apologies and leave of absence. We have one apology this evening, which is Councillor David Slama. Confirmation of minutes from the last meeting held on the 10th of July 2018. Members, I look to you for a mover to adopt those minutes. Moved by Councillor Moran, seconded by Councillor Corbell Moore. Any questions about those minutes, members? There are none. I put that before you. Those in favour? Those against? Thank you, members. We carry and adopt those minutes in the meeting held on the 10th of July. Members, this evening we have two deputations and one public forum. So we'll start with item 7.1, members, which is Mr John Chapman. The uh, Commissioner for Small Business was a deputation regarding a friendly council initiative, which I understand that Councillor Abiyad will be moving a motion later in this evening's agenda. Mr Chapman, welcome to Council Chamber, and uh, the members will afford you a period of five minutes. Welcome. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor, and thank you, councillors, for the opportunity to talk about the Small Business Friendly Council initiative, which has been initiated by my office. We're hoping that we get the Adelaide City Council on board with this initiative. So far, we have 20 councils from around the state that have joined up since August of last year. What is the Small Business Council Initiative, the Friendly Council Initiative? It's basically a program designed to embed businesses much better with their local councils. In some cases, councils do this very well. Others do it okay and some don't do it uh, very well at all. We're seeking to get councils better engaged with the small businesses in their area. This recognises that councils as local government are the closest to their business community of any of the arms of government. 
Small business are an integral part of the local economy and boost the economy with their activities. So a better engagement, a better way for council to work through the particular issues uh, with small business and indeed look at small business in terms of the policy context. When new policies, when uh, new motions are being moved, how will this affect small business in the council area? How can we engage with small business uh, in a better context? Adelaide City Council already doing a fantastic job in this area. Um, we see regularly Sergio Matiazzo and Brian Jackway uh, in our office, but out on the streets talking to businesses. Uh, last Friday night, Lord Mayor uh, talking to businesses in Gawler Place about the redevelopment and some of the little hurdles that that project has uh, touched. So Adelaide City Council already in that space, already doing a lot of initiatives. We would like to see the council on board as a leader in this uh, program. And what we're seeking is for councils to sign up to a charter, and it's a simple charter, a commitment to small business, a commitment to customer service. Simplifying the relationship with small business. As everyone knows, the one thing that uh, where small business do struggle, it is with the red tape and the processes of all arms of government. We'd like to see councils commit to a 30-day payment program. Some councils interstate that have, uh, there's a similar program operating in New South Wales, are paying their, their small businesses within 14 days. Dispute resolution, when there's a dispute, how does council handle that? Uh, and we, we are keen to work with councils in those areas and we do work with councils, particularly when disputes arise with small business. Procurement, buying from businesses within the council area, where it makes sense and where it's cost effective. The only other thing we ask of the council is to sign up to producing three initiatives a year. So these are initiatives that can help small business and can be from a whole range of areas. Uh, one uh, that's quite popular is exporting to China. What, it, what are councils doing in that space to help their small businesses? But it could be anything. Look at the Gig City project, a massive project undertaken by the council and one that's very, very good for business. We ask councils to provide a, a case study to us, which we can share with other councils. And we're working on a program in October where we bring the uh, staff from the various councils together to share the ideas so that ideas from one council can be spread across other councils. We look forward to the council's support in this program and I wish you the best in your deliberations. Thank you very much for your opportunity, the opportunity tonight to talk about our initiative. Thank you very much, Mr Chapman. Now, Councillor Abiyad will be introducing this as a motion in Motions Without Notice and will explain the time sensitive and other matters regarding this motion. Thank you very much for your deputation, sir. Uh, members, the second is a deputation which uh, is re with regards to item 15.1 on your agenda, but can I please welcome Mr Matthew Kennedy to a deputation regarding tree replacement in Hurtle Square. Mr Kennedy, welcome, and uh, the members will afford you a period of five minutes. Thank you, Lord Mayor, and thank you, Council Members, for the opportunity to discuss this issue. Before you is a petition um, issued through uh, Councillor Antic, and we acknowledge his help and assistance in this matter, uh, in the replacement of two trees in the northeast quadrant of Hurdle Square. The council has undertaken some work in that area, some beautification of the northeast quadrant. It's been greatly appreciated by the residents in that area, and I'm sure people who use Hurdle Square would notice the vast difference that it's made. The petition before you is to request the council to authorise the removal of two existing trees in that northeast quadrant. They're the only two trees remaining from the works that have been undertaken and they look completely out of place in, the, in that line along the street of the new trees that have been planted. So a petition was generated by the residents of the apartment complex of 2 to 26 Hurdle Square and it was canvassed the views of all the residents in that apartment complex. Each uh, apartment was issued with um, a voting slip with one week to respond in whichever manner they wished. There was a lot of discussion that took place amongst the residents uh, about this issue because some people feel quite strongly about it. 
and then the votes were uh, collated by one of the members and the petition was put together and issued through Councillor Antic. So there's a very fair and reasoned process that took place. The underlying issue is that nobody in the complex wants to reduce any number of trees. In fact, we've lobbied to have additional trees planted and the, um, uh, the council has authorised at least one additional tree. So we're not looking to reduce any number of trees at all. We're just looking for the two trees that are there to be replaced. The two, the two trees that are there have a limited lifespan and we believe that in five years time when they uh, come to the end of their life, which is according to the arborist, their life expectancy, they're then going to be replaced and there's going to be an uneven uh, scape to look at because the two new trees would then be out of place as the two are out of place now. We're looking for them to provide consistency of growth, to beautify the square, just not for now, but for the future as well, as the trees will grow in unison. So our goal is to keep the square looking at its best. We ask the council to authorise the replacement of the two trees, so we have a uniform panoramic vista of what is perhaps Adelaide's most beautiful square, which is for us today, for those of us that live there, for those that use the square, but for those in the future. And also, I believe in September 2017, there was another petition um, put through the council to have the grass on the western side of the square in the northeast quadrant to uh, go from where it is right to the edge of the curb. So we ask that to be included in any works that might be uh, might be undertaken. Please accept my thanks for the opportunity, Lord Mayor and Council members, to speak on this matter. Thank you. Thank you kindly, Mr Kennedy. Members, our third matter is Ms Maddie Saar, uh, which is a public forum. And the topic is council divestment from fossil fuels. Welcome, Ms Saar, and uh, the councillors will afford you a period of five minutes. Welcome to the council chamber. Thank you, um, and thanks for the chance to speak. Um, I'm hoping to be at <coughs> another group member, Jim, to be able to speak as well within the five minutes, if that's possible. Within the five minutes, that's fine. Great. <laughs> um, so I'm part of a group, an Adelaide community group called Fossil Free Adelaide, um, and we're asking Adelaide City Council to divest from fossil fuels. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that, but I kind of want to start by just explaining what our group is and why this is important to us. Um, so we're a group of people who care about climate change, basically. Um, and I've cared about climate change for quite a while. I'm 23 and I found out about climate change when I was about 14 um, and really became concerned about it because of the impacts on vulnerable people in my community um, and in communities all around the world. Um, and our group, I guess, is mainly motivated by the urgency of climate change. This is an issue that um, the world leaders have been negotiating since before I was born, um, but still we're on track to reach over three degrees global warming. Um, and so it's clear that a lot needs to change. Um, and some of the things that motivate our group are concerns around heat waves and storm surges and bushfires and the, the kind of impacts that we're going to see in South Australia and already are seeing. Um, and when we looked at what we could do about this, we thought about why this crisis is still continuing. And one of the main reasons is that the fossil fuel industry has a huge amount of financial power. Um, and this really has been allowed to override the safety and health of our communities. Um, and this really needs to stop. We can't really rely on a business model anymore that plans to continue digging up fossil fuels and burning them. And so our institutions need to stop investing in this industry. Um, so we see a lot of hope in the fact that uh, rene the renewable energy sector is really growing and we have all the technology we need to go to 100% renewable energy. Um, and there's also a lot of hope in local governments around the world that are really rising to the challenge of climate change, including this local government. Um, and so divestment is basically a way of using money to put a vote of no confidence in fossil fuels. 
we are asking Adelaide City Council and all councils to divest from fossil fuels, which basically means moving money into out of banks that invest in the top fossil fuel companies um, and into banks that don't. So, yeah, I guess we're asking <laughs> asking for this as a way of standing with our group um, for a clean future. Um, and if there's still time, I'd like to just pass on to Jim to talk a little bit more about it. Thank you, Lord Mayor and Councillors, for allowing me to speak on this uh, extremely serious uh, issue of climate change. Jim, if you could kindly state your name for the Council Chamber, please. Uh, sorry, Jim Allen. Thank um, Thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'd just like, in, in the little time I've got, to speak to a, uh, a report which has reviewed the performance of councils in, in, in divesting from fossil fuels in Australia, and over 30 councils since 2014 have been divesting from fossil fuels. Um, the name of the report is um, um, so a snapshot on progress, sorry. Um, it, it indicates that councils can substantially divest without compromising returns, and mostly this has involved changes to investment in surplus funds as part of cash management, cash flow management. About 70% divestment is the, the benchmark. Our fossil fuels are facing growing competition from renewable energy and are becoming a risky investment. And the other side of the, the coin is that councils may invest in renewable energy. Uh, one example of that is the City of Melbourne, which is um, part of a, a group of institutions that uh, has formed a power purchase agreement, uh, which is uh, underwriting the uh, construction of a wind farm near Ararat. Um, other opportunities are shifting uh, transactional banking services um, to one of the banks uh, with reasonably good credit rating that uh, uh, provide those services and have divested from fossil fuels. Another area is uh, in employee super, although council has only an advisory role there. It's really great to see this council committing to sustainable procurement uh, and things like building tune-ups and sustainable uh, initiatives in, uh, incentives. Um, we'd like to see you keep that up, that's great. Uh, but divestment sends an important message. The, the social licence to pollute is over, and um, we, we, we need to, uh, to, to maintain a critical mass to, to get that message through, and that involves divesting and taking action, uh, not just words. Um, we'd, we'd like to help uh, and work with Council on this. Um, we would uh, do that immediately by sending material um, to the elected members and staff, uh, which provides more background on this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Allen, and thank you, Ms. Saar. Thank you very much indeed. Members, that concludes our public forums and deputations today, so I'll take you directly onto item eight, petitions of which we have nil. So I take you now to item nine, which is advice from the Adelaide Parklands Authority and other committees. Members, you've got 9.1, you've got reports to note, noting that part of this will be addressed in item 12.3 later in your agenda, which is the draft integrated biodiversity management plan. Members, I'm in your hands. Do I have a mover? Councillor Wilkinson, seconded by Councillor Moran. Any questions regarding these reports, members? Summing up, Councillor Wilkinson, members, I put this before you to note those in favour. Those against, we carry item 9.1. Members, Lord Mayor's report, item 10.1. I recently travelled to Singapore to the World City Summit and participated in the Moy also participated in the Mayor's Forum delivered a keynote speech on the importance of culture to the livability of cities and was a member of two panels regarding smart city technology and autonomous vehicles. I also hosted an investment roundtable in partnership with the Australian High Commissioner in Singapore, His Excellency Bruce Gosper, which attracted 14 significant Singaporean investment groups. While in the region, I also visited our sister city of Georgetown and Penang, where I met with the Mayor and the Council of Penang Island. I must say, members, I was extremely impressed, as I'm sure Councillor Maloney will echo, by their efforts to preserve Georgetown's heritage and how they have used that as a key tourism driver for their region. Members, a formal report on both of those trips will be brought before you in a timely manner, and I'd like to thank CEO uh, Director Ian Hill and uh, Craig Burton for accompanying me on that trip and my Chief of Staff, Ben Saint. It was a very productive, outcome-focused trip, which I'm sure, members, you will see very shortly within the report which will come before you. Um, members, I recently here in Adelaide hosted the Mayor of Chattanooga, Tennessee, Mr Andy Burke. 
where we provided him with a tour of our smart city studio and discussed 10 gigabit Adelaide. There are a lot of synergies in terms of our adoption of technology between our cities. Also recently met with the Australian Consul General at Chengdu, of course, which is our friendly city in China, Mr Christopher Lim. Further, in partnership with the Adelaide Convention Bureau, I hosted delegates from the China-based Infinitis Group as part of an ongoing incentive tourism bid process. Should this bid be successful, it will amount to some 8,000 tourists visiting our city in 2020, and I thank Councillor David Slama for his assistance in that endeavour. Over the past month, I hosted a number of Lord Mayoral receptions in the Queen Adelaide Room, including a celebration in recognition of Eid al-Fitr. Thank you, Councillor Abiyad, for your leadership in that regard. A celebration for the 40th anniversary of the South Australian Heritage Act. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. And a reception for the finalist of the Adelaide Parklands Prize, whose award ceremony I also attended the Adelaide Festival Centre. And thank you all councillors for your support of that. That is a very important annual award, or biannual awards. Um, I thank the Deputy Lord Mayor Sandy Vershaw for hosting a reception to welcome delegates of the Pan Papa Palia Dance Convention recently held in Adelaide. And also thank you to the DLM for speaking at the launch of NADOC in Rundle Mall and the Lord Mayor's morning tea and flag raising ceremony for NADOC Week here at Adelaide Town Hall. I provided the opening speech at the Aboriginal to uh, Transport Symposium, spoke at the handover dinner and awards night for the Lions Club City of Adelaide and spoke at the City Awards only last night. And thank you, councillors, for joining me at the Advertiser Building in recognition of our city's many small businesses, many of which did receive some well-recognised awards. Took part in a panel session for the 20th anniversary of the Entrepreneurs' Organisation in South Australia, joined the Bastille Day celebrations at the Adelaide Central Market and of the Adelaide Art, or the Art Gallery of South Australia, attended the City of Adelaide Pipe Band Annual Dinner and attended the grand opening of the renovated Chinatown Plaza with Councillor Abia. Spoke at the Adelaide City Care Welcome Dinner for newly arrived migrants, as well as a welcome session hosted by, my, my, by Migration SA. CEO, can I also thank Sergio Matiazzo and Brian Jack, Jackway, who were at those functions and did a very good job. Also spoke at the 2018 South Australian Institute of Architects Awards, attended the celebration of the completion <coughs> of the facade works on the Great Street entrance, the Adelaide Central Market and hosted a luncheon very recently for the South Australian Games Appeal Committee. Lady Mayoress attended the 150th birthday celebration for the Royal Commonwealth Society, the Rotary Club of Adelaide Investiture for the incoming president and a MOSH presentation. And she was pleased to host the launch of the illustrated children's book, Clippership, City of Adelaide, Fun Facts and Figures, as well as hosted an afternoon tea here at Adelaide Town Hall for the auction prize winner supporting the United Nations Association of South Australia. Members, can I also please note um, that as recently as today, Dr Richard Harris um, was awarded by the Governor-General Sir Peter Cosgrove in Canberra, um, bestowed the official Australian honours to all nine Australians involved in the search and rescue, rescue mission to free the 12 young Thai boys and their soccer coach trapped in a flooded cave system. Our very own anaesthetist, Dr Richard Harris, and his dive partner, Dr. Richard Challen, were presented with the second highest Australian bravery decoration for acts of conspicuous courage in circumstances of great peril. So members, I'm sure you share uh, congratulations for that extraordinary act by those people who helped save those boys. Members, can I please have a mover to adopt the Lord Mayor's, thank you, Councillor Wilkinson, seconded by Councillor Corbell Moore. All those in favour? Those against, we carry. Thank you very much, members. That concludes item 10 on your agendas, which takes you to item 11. Members, councillors reports 11.1. Can we Yes, we can. So members, do I have any queries or questions or any individual members who want to speak to their report? Councillor Hender. I'd like to speak to my, my report, Lord Members. Is this an opportunity, for, may I take this an opportunity to present or represent this marvellous crowd? Yes, it is, Councillor. So, as you mentioned in your um, Lord Mayor's report, um, you were uh, gracious enough to attend the celebration of the completion of the works for the Great Street, the Turtle Hall on Great Street. That's a beautiful red brick building at the Great Street side of the LA Central Market, um, which has been, over the last 10 months, had more than eight kilometres of brick tuck pointing done, hand done by really, really skilled tradesmen. I urge you guys, if you haven't already seen it. The Federal Hall was built as a, um, to commemorate Federation 
And so it's a, it's a precious building for us. Um, 4,500 4, hours were spent on the, re, on the repointing work, um, repairing uh, rented, and, and there was also repair of rented sections of the, of the facade. The timber windows have been restored. The original federal hall lecturing has been, been reinstated. So it gives me great pleasure to add this magnificent crown to your already magnificent spade. Um, <laughs> and thank you again to your attendance for being open. The councillor called me at all. <laughs> <laughs> Members, can we please a round round of applause? And CEO and to the team for working with the Adelaide Central Market Authority and members <clears throat> for supporting that initiative. Uh, it was a terrific restoration and a, uh, a wonderful piece of work, clearly preserving a lot of skilled trades in South Australia too, which is very important to all of us. Uh, thank you, Councillor Hender, greatly appreciate it. Members, any other questions or queries or comments with regards to your own report? In absence of that, I'll look for a mover. Moved by Councillor Martin, seconded by Councillor Clarehan. Members, I'll put this straight before you. Those in favour of adopting the members' reports, those against, we carry. Members, I'm going to take you directly to item 12 in your agenda. You've got 12.1 and 12.2. 12.1, you have a report to note. Do I have a mover? Moved by Councillor Clarehan, seconded by Councillor Hender. Councillor Clarehan, any comment? Councillor Hender? Members, any questions, queries, or comments? Otherwise, I'll keep the meeting moving. Councillor Malani. Difficult to go unblocked on those two, Councillor Malani. I will look for that opportunity later in the meeting where it's more appropriate. Members, I put this matter before you, 12.1. Those for it, those against it, we carry 12.1, which takes us to 12.2, North Adelaide Parking Review. You have a report to approve and note. Councillor Martin has his hand up first. Councillor Martin. Yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. I have an alternative uh, motion. Has that been provided in advance, Councillor Martin? It has, and um, I'm hoping it will be on your screens in a moment if it's not there already. If you could please confirm what it is on the screen. Okay. Councillor Martin, as the Secretary is doing that, I might ask you to please read out the alternate motion to your fellow members so we know what we're discussing. Floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, the first uh, part is changed so that it reads approves those parking controls in North Adelaide and then continues with a view as printed. The second point is agrees to grant every residential address in North Adelaide one on street parking permit transferable to visitors to that address. Such permits will be issued without fee, except for the charge required to offset administrative costs, which is to be not greater than the current cost of residential on-street parking permits. Three, instructs the administration to begin planning for the phased introduction by the beginning of 2019 of a permit system to allow North Adelaide business ratepayers to park in designated zones, including but not limited to areas currently classified as untimed. And four and five as is. Now, members, do you want time to reread that? Yes, okay, I'm going to give you two minutes to just reread that motion. Councillor Wilkinson, you then had your hand up first, followed by Councillor Moran. Are you looking to second what you've got in front of you? Yeah. Okay, well, I'm not going to start the debate yet, but members, I'm going to give you two minutes reading time. Please read that motion, and then I'm going to come back to the floor. Thank you. 
Now, members, have you had sufficient time to read this? Because I'm not going to enable the debate at this point in time. I just want to make sure that you are cognizant of what you're about to debate, potentially. So, the CEO would like to make a comment first, which is his right to do so. So, CEO, you'd like to make a comment before we enter debate? Yes, yeah, really, Lord Mayor. Look, I totally understand and appreciate the sentiment and intent of the motion. From an administrative point of view, I do have concerns that we've not been able to provide you um, advice at this time. That's my only concern. Um, I understand what is proposed and I don't have a problem, but I'd like to be given the, afforded the opportunity to give you that advice, which I cannot do sitting here tonight. So, members, what I'm then going to suggest you do, because this is an alternate recommendation uh, motion from what was recommended. <coughs> Councillor Martin, you could preserve that and put a preamble and call for a report and bring this matter back in two weeks' time so it's an informed debate. As your presiding member, my sole job is to ensure that the members are having an informed debate. I have to take the advice of the CEO. Councillor Martin, if you were to preamble that with call for a report two, they can then come back to this chamber and then we can have an informed debate. I'm happy to move deferral. Move deferral of this motion. Well, I don't have a motion yet because I've got to formally declare a seconder, Councillor Moran. But well, you formally second has been declared a seconder and I have my first, but I'm happy to defer Councillor Martin's motion to the next council meeting to allow um, administrative... Um, second. I'm that. Okay, there was a seconder, Councillor Wilkins, and that is correct, but Councillor Martin has yet to speak to it. So, Councillor Moran, I'll take that on notice. You may do that. Councillor Martin, you've heard what the CEO said. I cannot enable this to proceed on its basis now because the CEO is quite rightly informed that the councillors would be making a decision of which they would not have the full understanding of the impacts of the decision. Look, my, I. You know, look, Lord Mayor, I want the best possible outcome on this, but the problem is, and the reason why I moved this, is that we've been talking about this for two years and four months. We've spent 100 odd thousand, 150,000, we've had six public uh, meetings, we've had about four months of online consultation, we've had six council I will, I will interject. Respect all that. Council Moran, please wait through the process. Councillor Martin, I respect all that. However, you've got a clear choice to make. What would you like to do? Oh, look, I'm in the hands of the Chamber, Lord Mayor. Okay, so, Councillor Wilkinson, do you wish to speak to this matter as it stands? I'm going to... You're not accepting it, so we don't have to talk to it. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> Councillor Moran. Uh, yeah, I'll speak to the deferral. Look, I understand what Councillor Martin is asking for. It was actually a motion that I moved and Councillor Antic seconded some time ago, and we always anticipated that every car, every ratepayer had a residential sticker as per Burnside Council. Um, we were rather sidetracked by the, um, the confusing information that I know that will come again on the comment that they won't all fit in. They all fit in now. Every ratepayer that has a car in North Adelaide fits in. Every business person and staff, they fit in. Councillor Moran, I apologise. I'm going to interject. Just like I didn't enable Councillor Martin the opportunity to speak, I'm going to do the same. Members, I'm not accepting this motion. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So we... Just a question. Why aren't you accepting the motion? In respect of that, Lord Mayor, if you're not accepting the motion, you're not accepting the one that was proposed by the administration either. Is that correct? No, that is incorrect. We've got nothing. Well, Lord Mayor, you, have to, you, can't, you can't not accept the motion without any reason. It's a perfectly okay. acceptable legal reader. It's, it's out, outrageous that the Lord Mayor would refuse an on okay. Members, let me explain. The, me the motion you have before you, based upon the advice from the CEO, I take, I accept, and I'm not going to accept this motion. 
So, Councillor Martin, I provided you with the opportunity to change that motion. Uh, so we don't have a motion before us now. So what you... I think that's outrageous, Lord Mayor. I'm sorry, with all due respect, for a, 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 an accepted motion on notice. No, no councillor, it, it's not a motion on notice. It was an alternate motion from the start. This is not the motion which was put before you. Could you announce so, that reason, though, just to put my mind at rest? Okay, CEO, can you just please reiterate? Well, just as I said earlier, I think it's very important for council members to have all the information that's required to make an informed decision. And at this time, I can't give it to you. And we will certainly pick up exactly what is proposed and provide you that advice to the next meeting. Not a Members, you could defer this matter now with a new motion. Yes, you could, but Councillor Rand, you could move that as a motion now. I'm not accepting the motion that Councillor Rand. Councillor Rand, it's quite reasonable. Members, it's quite reasonable. The role as presiding member of the Local Government Act meeting regulations is to ensure that you have a fully informed debate. You know that, you realise that. The CEO has advised that this would not enable that in this instance, so I can't accept this motion. I need another one. The floor is yours. Okay. Councillor Wilkinson had his hand up first, Councillor Rabiot. Councillor Wilkinson, what would you like to do? Uh, may I suggest that the motion seeks to uh, defer the item to enable the, the words of his. Um, Motion and then Councillor Wilkinson, you can do that because I have not accepted Councillor Martin's motion, so you can do that. But I've done that. No, you haven't got a motion. Look, Lord Mayor, it was, uh, look, it was read to the chamber, it was seconded by Councillor Wilkinson. The motion is there. If there is going to be a kerfuffle about this issue, and we've waited two years and four months, so we can wait another fortnight then I will accept the amended motion that I put forward being deferred until the next meeting of council. Okay, members, I just, I'm being very procedural here. You put forward a motion which I did not accept. So I now need another motion to process forward. Councillor Wilkinson, please explain to the chamber what you'd like to do. Um, well, then I just move that we defer it to the fortnight meeting um, to enable uh, consideration of the, the point set out in Councillor Martin. So Martin's. he can do that. Yeah. You're deferring this matter for two weeks. To, no, to consider the specific. Yes, yes he, we can. He can do that. Yeah. Councillor Abiyad, he can do that. So I need Please a second for right. that yeah. motion. Just a point of order. I'm sorry, just a point of order. This is important to know. You cannot defer a motion that was not accepted. He needs to defer this motion. That's what I need to understand because I keep I'm hearing Councillor Wilkinson say that he wants to defer it to consider that. That can't be done, correct? Judy he Speaker. Can. He can. He's creating a new motion to defer. Members, we're taking procedural advice, please. Members, if I can clarify for you, what is before you in the process of being moved by Councillor Wilkinson is a motion to defer the matter to the next meeting to enable the matters that Councillor Martin has initiated and proposed to be considered and brought back to you in a fortnight's time. Okay, so I need a seconder for that to happen. Do I have a seconder? <laughs> Councillor Martin had his hand up first. Yes. Councillor Wilkinson, do you wish to speak to it or we just move on? Uh, this is what we've been trying to achieve from the outset. So if that's the purpose of the motion, I'm very happy for the administration for the opportunity to provide their comments. Thank you. Members, do I have any further debate? Yeah. You'd like to debate, Councillor Rabia? I would, I would, I really would. Um, Lord Mayor, to my understanding is, I don't see a difference between this motion and the motion that was moved before, because in essence, what was moved right now, I would like to think is a deferral of the current recommendation. So this current recommendation for this item, we're deferring to another time. Now, when it comes to another meeting, then Councillor Martin, any other councillor that wants to bring changes, that's when they will occur, then it will come back to council. I am hoping that the administration is not going to um, look at this motion that's been deferred for you to go and do homework about a motion that wasn't accepted by the Lord Mayor. You shouldn't do any homework until we tell you to do homework. So this is what I really need to create a very um, delineated approach with it because this is the bit I don't understand. Councillor Wilkinson has just moved pretty much the exact same thing that Councillor Martin did uh, in deferring this motion because he's saying defer it to consider the aspect of Councillor Martin's recommendation. 
Now, the administration shouldn't do that until this council makes a decision that that's what they want to do. So I need to provide, I need, so that's a question. Based on this motion, will the administration go and do homework on Councillor Martin's motion that was just put? Councillor, I'll be able to take procedural advice and we'll hand you to the CEO. Do you Members, expect? if I can clarify for you, the motion before you is not deferring any motion. It is deferring the subject matter so that the report that comes back will address the matters that Councillor Martin has identified so that before you, you have enough information on both activities, that which has been presented to you this evening and that which Councillor Martin has initiated through his initial motion yep. in a fortnight's time. So it, it doesn't replace or displace, it will give you more information to action your decision making. So I practically, Councillor, I presume a report will come, information will come back to you, I get that. which would be a report to note and then yeah, it'll be in the hands of the Chamber I'll, to move something out of that should they I wish. Look, I'm, I'm going to speak against this. I don't, I don't support a deferral because in essence, if Councillor Martin moved the motion today, we would have lost it and we would go back doing our normal homework without having to waste hours and hours and hours of right place time, which he does every single time with the administration. I don't want to waste time. The reason this has taken so long was well, Mayor, that's a consistent. I mean, he really is beyond the pale. He's a proper boy. He Councillors, must think again. Councillors, so I, think I disallow the motion because you would have not been able to make an informed decision. I think my right to do that you should accept the, the motion. meeting provisions of the local government. You should accept the motion. My word is final on that, members. I respect that. I don't support the deferral because this deferral will create more work for our administration, work I am not authorising as a councillor. I don't want to do that. I don't see that this motion is looking at providing parking permits for everyone in the central ward and everyone in the south ward and apartments in the city that are being built but they don't even have car parks in the city. This is not an equitable approach to how council should operate and this is a problem. So I don't endorse any motion that would ask our administration to do more work on this on top of the work that's already been done, I much prefer that the motion tonight is dealt with, lost, and we just move on with life. Because this political approach to always trying to give back something to get votes from what I believe is an issue and is a problem. Because this is consistent, Lord Mayor. Let's provide everyone a free parking permit. Let's provide everyone a free pass to the aquatic centre. Let's provide let's let's provide everyone everything for free. So you know what? Free for all the city of Adelaide should be our Logan. It shouldn't be designed for life, it should be designed for free, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. It's your right to debate whether we should defer or not. Now, I've got Councillor Hender had hand up, then I've got Councillor Moran. We are members, you are, you are debating a motion moved by Councillor Wilkinson whether to defer or otherwise. Councillor Hender? I do support the deferral. I think we need, I'm, I'm always happy for us to be provided with more information so that we can make decisions. But I would like any administrative work to be done on, any administrative work that is done on that, this issue, to take into account and report back to us on the issue of equity. The ratepayers that I represent in the central ward would be up in arms, I have to say, up in arms if all residents, in all residents, I think it said, and, and the proposal that Councillor um, uh, Martin put forward, um, all residents get a, a free car park um, for guests in circumstances where North Adelaide residents often have commodious um, backyards, front yards, driveways, um, that very few city residents have. Um, and so I would very much like the issue of equity to be covered in the report. Um, I, I won't vote for something just to let Councillor Martin know. I know that the idea is to pilot, is to pilot some things in, in North Adelaide, but to pilot things that give such a significant advantage to one portion of our city and deny it for others would, in my view, um, cause an uproar. And I think that needs to be addressed in any um, report that we get tabled. Thank you, Councillor Hender. Councillor Moran. I don't understand why there'd be an uproar. This, is, this was agreed on to study this in North Adelaide. Not in central, nobody in central ward or south ward is going to be. No, 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 we're talking about North Adelaide residents. All no, no. All North Adelaide No, we're talking residents in the area that the trial's coming to. But how does that affect how does that affect central or south? It's only so they can park in their own streets. 
Uh, I absolutely do, and that's why we all agreed two years ago that we would do this in North Adelaide. Trust me, this is not an easy thing to do in your in your own area. If we get this wrong in North Adelaide, heads will roll. Um, it was it was possible for any of you ward councillors to um, bring a parking study into your ward, but it was North Adelaide that decided to do it, and it's not an easy thing to do. And this is one of the rare occasions that I do agree with um, Councillor Martin because it, after all, it was my initiative to start with. And my initiative started with everybody with a car in North Adelaide having one. You're quite right, it is commodious. And I think that's why we decided to start it there because it was easier to work out. Um, North Adelaide's got hospitals, university colleges, school, and so forth. So it's, a diff it's, it's an eclectic area. And that's what uh, Vanessa and Claire did because we could look at the very built up areas like Lower North Adelaide that's very similar to some areas in the South. Uh, so this was a great, this is not a, a class war between Central or South. But we need to give the people that park their cars in North Adelaide a residential sticker such as Burnside because we only decided to go along this route prior to this because we were told they wouldn't all fit in. It suddenly dawned on us that's a ridiculous statement. Of course they will fit in because they all fit in now. Um, if we start tinkering with our parking, I really would have preferred it to be down in the south to tell you the truth. Um, and then, then you can take the heat. Um, but so you've got the free bus service in a very similar area. But I think the, the the scheme in North Adelaide will then quickly, when we get it right, roll out to your areas too. I'm not sure whether it would at, would fit the central at all because it's so such a densely populated area. But it would transfer to the south very easily. But so let's not get up up in politics and and likes and dislikes. Um, I, I'm not come, as I said. I don't often agree with councillor. Uh, Martin, but in this one, because it was my idea, I certainly do agree with him. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Rand, Councillor Martin, you reserved your right on this motion to defer. Are you speaking to it? Yes, I am, Lord Mayor. The floor is yours. Uh, contrary to uh, what Councillor Abbott was saying, it is important for everyone to have all of the information available. And frankly, the way that the proposal was put to uh, the Chamber on this occasion was bound to create difficulties. We have talked consistently about uh, three particular actions that would be associated with the local area traffic and parking management. And that was uh, a review of residential permits, the possibility of business permits, and clamping down on commuter parking. Now, if you separate one of those out from all of the others, it has adverse impacts. Because what you're doing is contracting the number of parking spaces that are available to the local community, to the residents. You're reducing the number of opportunities that local people have to park and increasing the competition for the remaining parks among commuters. That's why the whole suite is necessary. That's why uh, I'd like it to be reviewed. And I thank uh, Councillor Moran for her, her thoughts and her arguments in this instance, and Councillor Wilkinson, who've, uh, who've always understood this is a suite of measures, and if you take one out, then you simply disturb the balance. And that, that was the reason for that proposal. So look, I really welcome the opportunity uh, to hear the administration's uh, account of uh, where that sits, and I'd ask them to particularly consider what happens when you introduce one, one element without all of the others. And I do ask them to go and talk to uh, organisations like the North Adelaide Precinct Association, who have very strong views about this uh, and who uh, have communicated that in the past few days. Um, and yes, Lord Mayor, I will support the deferral. Thank you, Councillor. Members, no further debate. Councillor Wilkinson, summing up. Uh, yes, I think there's been some uh, misunderstanding about the uh, residential uh, exemption permits as it's distinct from residential permits. So we have residential permit zones, which we've got throughout North Adelaide in the city where no one can park except for people who don't have a car park in a pre-1972 building. No one can park there other than the people with the permits. That is not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is what they have in, say, Rose Park, where it says two hour parking, residents, resident permit exempted which means that commuter parks don't park in, in Rose Park and walk into town. So people who live in 
uh, Rose Park and park out the front of their house in their own street. That's the thing. It's it's not the it's not the dedicated permit that no one can park. So anyone can park there, but only for the time limit. That's the distinction. That's what we were trying to achieve uh, from the onset. And uh, Anne Ran, myself, and Philip Martin, and, and I think Sue as well, have been uh, in North Adelaide have been. Uh, talking about this from the onset. And, and the recommendation from our administration was that we start looking at this as a way of dealing with the commuter parking and the problems that causes for residents and businesses in the area first. And then once we've bedded that down, then we look at South Adelaide where commuter parking is also problematic for residents and businesses, where we would then look at the commuter parking in, in the south of the city. And that's the reason why it's been done in this sequence. It's not some elitist thing towards North Adelaide actually our own staff's recommendation to, to do it in two bites so that we can take a more considered approach. So I hope that that, that distinction between the two types of permits is, is properly understood because it's, it's just an exemption thing. So, uh, um, uh, and I'm very happy to get the further advice from our administration on that understanding. Thank you. Members, you have a motion to defer in front of you. I put this matter before you. Those in favour? Those against? Motion to defer carries. Members, I take you on to, and I will unblock wherever I practically can, items 12.3, which is Draft Integrated Biodiversity Management Plan. You've got a recommendation to adopt and authorise. Lounders Boathouse Precinct Improvements. You've got a recommendation to note and approve. And 12.5, Power Outage Support for Ratepayers. You have a report to note. I will look to you on those three items, members, to, uh, with a view to an unblock. Should that be achievable? No, I won't. So, members, three items. You're moving. Does members? We we'll do this by exception. Do you want to remove? Do you want to pull out any of those three items, or shall we unblock them? Twelve point three, twelve point four, and twelve point five. Members, you're not twelve point four. Okay. So, members, I don't have any other pulled out. I don't, so 12.3 and 12.5 I put before you. Can I have a mover, please, members? Moved by Councillor Martin, seconded by Councillor Milani. Members, I put 12.3 and 12.5 before you. Those in favour? Those against? They are carried. Item 12.4, Councillor Wilkinson, which is Lounders Boathouse Precinct Improvements, page 81. There's a recommendation to note and approve. Note and approve. What would you like to do? Uh, yeah, like, I'd like to move as recommended and uh, give my appreciation to the uh, staff who've worked on this project. And uh, if you look at the uh, archival photograph of Lounders Boat Ship, you can see that what's being proposed is to um, uh, reinstate the pavilion next to Lounders Boat Shed and also the, um, the uh, second pier on, on the river. Councillor, you're moving his printer. I'll yes. find you a second to please. Members, Councillor Moran. So I just commend our um, staff who's worked on this project and it's, it's going to be a wonderful transformation for this part of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Moran, you seconded. Do you wish to speak to this matter? You don't. Councillor Hender, you've got your hand up. Well, I just had a couple of questions, actually. Sorry, I didn't get an opportunity to get into the um, room beforehand. Um, the, 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 I can't remember what it's called, the proposed gable structure. That it, it looks in some of the pictures to be a solid structure. That's not the case, is it? It's, it's open? Yeah, okay. And the pier, um, will that pier, if built, for what purpose will that pier be used? Will it be a pedestrian, sorry, a, um, what are you if you're a customer of a, of a Popeye? Um, will it be for, for um, for the general public to get on and off, or is it up here for storage and, and um, for parking? CEO. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, through the chair, the, the pier will be used for landings for motorised vehicles on the on the torrents. There will be public access, yes, so people can use it when it's not being used by, for instance, Popeye or anyone else that wants to use that pier to dock to, to actually access that precinct. That's the intent. So for the rowers as well? Yes, if okay. they need to, yes. Okay, great. Um, thank you. And um, my last question relates to, there's been some uh, some issues with um, antisocial behaviour down there. Does this design in any way address any of those issues? Well, the 
design work that's being done? The work that we'll look at and the report that we'll bring back as recommended in February will look at a suite of issues, including um, the congestion along the path along there. It can look at, and, and we can consider, um, the former Hort hub, the building that's up, located up near the um, uh, uh, Victoria Drive there, yes. Thank you. I'd appreciate that if you could, and perhaps lighting. I, mean, I think one of the issues is that some, very, some very significant anti-social behaviour associated with uh, illegal drinking, and um, it needs to be. This is an opportunity to address some of those issues too. So if you could make sure that that public safety work is done as part of the exercise, I'd be very grateful. Thank you, Councillor Hender, Deputy Lord Mayor. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, look, I just uh, would like to ask around the impact to Lounders Cafe. Obviously, we've got a great tenant in there who's doing some lovely business. And in 14.2, they have noted that the gable structure to be reinstated would have an impact on their business, both in the ability for outdoor for views and also so it would reduce their area and also further restrict vehicle access to the rowing clubs. Um, I, I couldn't quite gauge from the comments there whether they actually supported this happening or not. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah, through the chair, they are broadly supportive. I think in uh, paragraph 19.2, we will look at the design more practically to see what will work, and obviously that will form part of our report back to council. But Lounders generally, at a high level, are very supportive. Thank you, Dean. Mem members, any further debate? There is none. Uh, Councillor Wilkinson summing up. Members, I put this matter before you. Those in favour? Those against? The item is carried, item 12.4. Members, item 12.6, LGA membership, you have a report to note. Members, do I have any uh, declarations that need to be made before this matter is debated, councillors? I don't. No, okay, so members, we have a report to note. I'm in your hands. Councillor Mulaney, you're moving as printed. Members, I look for a seconder and a report to note, please. LGA membership 12.6. Councillor Clearhan. Um, Lord Mayor, I have um, a perceived conflict of interest given my position um, on the LGA board and as president. Uh, so if there's any discussion, um, I'll either upset myself or I'll just not vote on the issue. The decision is yours. You need to state your intention either way, actually. Oh, Council okay. Chair. Well, I won't vote. You won't vote? Okay. So, members, we have a report to note. It's been moved by Councillor Milani. I look for a seconder. Councillor Hender. Any debate, members? Councillor Milani. No, summing up. Summing up, members, I put this matter before you to note. Those in favour? Those against? We carry item 12.6. Now, members, we're now going to do an on-blocking exercise for items 12.7, so please keep an eye on your agendas. Items 12.7 to 12.11. Are there any matters between 12.7 and 12.11 which you would like to extract for the purposes of debate, otherwise we will on-block the balance? Councillor, we're doing a call over. I'll start from the top. 12.7. No hands. Sorry, I'll do this sequentially, Councillor, if I can. 12.8. No hands. 12.9. Nine's got two alternatives in it, and I understand it was. That is correct. Okay, we will, we will, that matter we will debate separately. 12.10. Okay, members, 12.10, no debate. 12.11. That's a report to note. Okay, so members, what I'm going to do is 12.7, 12.8, 12.10 and 12.11. There will be no debate. Councillor Milani is moving. I'd need a seconder, please. Councillor Moran, I put these matters before you, members. Those in favour? Those against? We've now carried items 12.7, 8, 10 and 11. Now, members, item 12.9. Councillor Moran has hand up first. Local Government Rate Oversight Amendment Bill 2018, page 102. Members, do I have any declarations? 
calling me to allow me to... Yeah. Lord Mayor, I haven't perceived an actual um, conflict of interest as I'm president of the Local Government Association and the Local Government Association has uh, determined their opposition to rate capping on a previous occasion. So um, I may um, participate in the debate to add information, but I won't be voting. Stating that to the record, Councillor Clarehan. Now, Councillor Moran, we have a recommendation before us which is an either or. What would you like to do? I move that this matter lay on the table, and if you give me some latitude, oh, we've got a second anyway. Um, the reason I want this uh, to move this unusual, um, unusual um, uh, procedural motion is that we are separate. We're divided on this issue. Uh, privately. Uh, we have the president um, of this organisation in our, in our midst, so it's, it's a delicate, delicate situation. We are a different entity to other, um, other uh, local government councils. We're a capital city for one, we operate under a separate act, um, so the, the problems of rates and so forth that other, that other councils have are not the Sorry. All right. Yeah. You've Councillor Moran, thank you. I will look for a seconder and we'll just proceed at this point in time. Okay. So do I have a seconder, members, for this motion? Happy to say that be laid on the table. Second uh, by Councillor Abiyad. So, Councillor Moran, I'm going to go straight to the vote, Councillor. Oh, just let them table. You don't want reasons? Yep. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Moran. So members, we have a we have those in favour of laying this matter on the table. Those in favour? Can I see your hands, please, members? Those against? Okay, this matter has been carried to lay on the table. Members, thank you. So members, we've now dealt with, we'll move on to emerging key risks. Now, members, the CEO has advised that there are two emerging key risks which will be contemplated in confidence, which the CEO would like to share with you. Uh, one of those is a matter with regarding a major event and the other is a matter regarding liquor. It's a liquor licensing matter. So members, they will both be dealt with in confidence and I will deal with those before we deal with the body of other matters which we will be dealing with in confidence. So I will take you directly on to questions on notice. We have Neil. Members, do I have any questions without notice? I don't see any hands. So members, I now take you to motions on notice, item 15.1, motion on notice regarding replacement of trees, northeastern quadrant of the Hurtle Square, page 115, Councillor Antic. Uh, right. Yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. I move it. Printed, do you want me to read that? Or... Uh, it was in the papers, Councillor, so I'm going to take it as read by your fellow elected members. Thank but you. We would Very require good. a seconder to proceed, seconded, seconded by seconded. Councillor Moran. The floor is yours, Councillor Antic. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, Lord Mayor, uh, we heard um, this evening from Mr Kennedy, who speaks on behalf of the residents of uh, the building on the eastern side of Hurdle Square, which is the older of the two, the newer one having recently been um, built. Uh, and we heard him talk in, in, in probably more detail than I can about the situation regarding um, that uh, that layer of trees and that garden bed there. It actually stems back uh, this issue to a motion moved um, I think uh, six months ago or so, which was to improve the area of the garden bed, which has been done terrifically well. Um, and the, um, the area now is looking absolutely fantastic. New garden beds, some, uh, some new paving, I think, and, uh, and some some new greenery down there, which is terrific. One of the issues which arose, though, is that uh, that uh, eastern side was lined by ash trees, which are um, in the order of 60 years old. Uh, and a number of them, I think uh, uh, six or seven of them were removed, I think, around about that number, uh, leaving two, um, two of their plus, and two which we're told have something like um, perhaps five years to go. So they, the ones that were removed were replaced with jacaranda trees, different species, but probably more important, more relevantly, a different height. Um, so what you see when you look out your window from that tree there, uh, from that building, is a layer of jacaranda trees, which are you know six, six and a half feet tall, and then two massive ash trees, which um, you know are at the end of their life. They're not in any particular um, uh, 
danger of um, you know dying anytime soon, but it's five or six years. Um, so the residents, um, having seen this development uh, of, the, of the footpath area go up, uh, approached me and said, "Look, you know, this is great, but it, it looks unfinished now. We've got this brand new um, walkway and promenade here, which we, we love, but we also have this problem with uh, a mishmash of trees, which might haunt us for a decade." Um, the issue, of course, is that if the trees are left there and then they're replaced with a species that's currently been put in as a replacement, they will be mile, miles out of whack. So we'll end up with little trees and big trees again. Um, and it really does spoil the aesthetic of the region. So um, it, it really is an issue of amenity. Um, and it's a fairly simple fix. These are not, um, you know, these are not trees which, which won't grow quickly. They'll, they'll grow reasonably quickly, these jacaranda trees. Um, and uh, there's a petition, as you saw, a petition which went around the building and had, I think, 27 of the, uh, how's my adding up, 30, 35 residents that were petitioned and responded, uh, 27 were in favour of, of removing this tree. Um, you only have to go down there to look to see what it actually does to the vista. It really is quite, um, you know, for a person that likes to line up their remote controls in front of the TV like I do, I can certainly sympathise. It's mildly OCD, Lord Mayor, but hey, you know, we might as well get it right. Uh, this actually, I think, is. I just had to throw that in, I don't know why. Um, I just briefly, Lord Mayor, this is a little bit, I think, in, in Monday. Councillors, will you afford Councillor Antic some additional time? Yes, Councillor, please proceed. Um, but in truth, this is, this is um, almost bittersweet for the residents down there because we have this brand new, beautiful um, landscaping and it just looks unfinished. So what we're asking for is not to take trees out, but actually replace them with those which have been put in there in the first place. It's a little bit like buying a new car with a great big scratch down the side of it. It's just not aesthetically pleasing to the eye. Or the, you know all about that as a uh, classic car lover, and I didn't scratch your car this afternoon. <laughs> so uh, I asked people, uh, members to go support it. We'll go and check now. I might if we lose. I might give the DLM the chair so I can check the garage. Thank you, Councillor Antic. Thank you very much indeed. So, members, this matter was seconded by Councillor Moran and then Councillor Corbell more, more wish to speak. Councillor Moran, do you wish to speak to this matter as a seconder? Um, <laughs> sorry, I wasn't paying attention. Oh, look, when, when, uh, I went and had a look at the trees today and they add up in the report there, they have five years to go, you know, if you can believe an arborist, but um, they do look as though they're on their way out. It is so rare for residents to want trees to be chopped down. You really have to take a lot of notice when they all get together and say they want them chopped down, especially in that section of the city where, pe where people are very socially, I find them very socially aware. Uh, so happy to go along with their wishes. It seems to be a strong community push. The trees are looking unattractive and tatty and I can see the logic behind the replacement. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Corbellmore. <coughs> Look, I, um, I have gone down and seen these trees um, and I really can't say that I'm leaning one way or the other. I do feel sympathetic to the residents of the building um, which have said no for a variety of reasons. And one of them who's written a handwritten note um, identifying the tree canopy as a place for, um, for creatures to live, birds and possums and, and the like. Um, and also noting the tree canopy um, also it's helping to reduce greenhouse gases. It's a mature tree. Um, it provides shade in summer, therefore reducing heat island effect in the city. We'll be replacing two very mature trees, which do, they do look healthy and they do have a lifespan of at least five years, if not more. Um, so whilst I'm sympathetic to the majority of the people in this apartment complex, they don't actually represent the views of the whole community because they haven't been consulted. We don't know what the people across the road think about having these trees removed or the people across the other side of the square. We just know the people in this one apartment complex. And we do know that on council, removing trees, chopping them down for some members of our community is a very sensitive issue. And our administration would not go ahead with removing these two trees outside of having a motion being brought into the chamber. That's why council has to make this decision. And as the ward councillor, uh, for me, it's going to come down to a question that I'm going to ask the administration. And it's based on some research that I've done outside of the administration notes, which is desert ash trees, are they part of our um, palette for planting in the city? Because I've read online that desert ash trees are actually weeds in 
Victoria, South Australia, ACT and New South Wales. And the jacarandas, which is what they'll be replaced with, are weeds in Queensland and New South Wales, but not here in SA, um, are desert ash trees still being planted in our parks and gardens and in our um, parklands? Or is this something from years before? Because they were popular back in the day. Thank you, Councillor. See you. Through Lord Mayor, I'm not sure if we can answer that. We might have to take it on notice. Clinton, are you aware? Um, no. Take that on notice if we can feed back to you. But that's really not helpful. If we could get an answer, like, isn't there somebody here that can let us know if we're still planting desert ash trees? I mean, I've, I've identified that the city of Mitcham um, sees them as a weed of the highest rating. No, not jacarandas, the desert ash, the tree that is actually there at the moment. Whilst it's mature, it's, it drops seeds and those seeds go into the waterways and they, they, they'll they plant themselves in our wetlands and our riverways. Councillor, we may have an answer to your question. CEO, Tom. Thank you. Through you, Lord Mayor, the, the tree that you're actually talking to tonight is a woolly weed, and the reality is we don't really uh, plant any of those trees anymore. It's not a normal tree that we put in the parklands or in the streetscapes. Okay, thank you. And and with that, that would be the rationale for me to chop down the tree. It's not so much based on um, this particular apartment complex's say and vote that they've done. It's more that we're not planting them anymore, and they're a weed. Thank you, Councillor. Members, do I have any further debate on this matter? Councillor Wilkinson. Uh, yes, I'm fairly vexed with this one, I must say. Um, the, uh, it's only two of the desert ash trees that remain, so the balance of growth have, have already been replaced. Um, but desert ash trees have been planted successfully as street trees in this council area and other council areas and some of the finest avenues residential avenues are planted with desert ash. I would only consider them a weed in a watercourse context that uh, Tom McCree has been dealing with the, with the creek thing. In that context, they're, they're, they're considered to block the watercourse type thing, but within a street tree situation, I think to consider them a weed would be a, a bizarre sort of way of looking, looking at what can be a very stately tree. But what has happened to many of them over the years is they've been badly pruned by EXA and they look like someone with gnarled fingers and they're not very stately looking trees. But when they're allowed to grow properly, they can be a very elegant tree, as elegant as a plain tree. So I would hope that we do keep um, uh, the ash tree and the claret ash tree, which is the red tree, within our thing, uh, because they're a good hardy street tree. Um, so we should have them in our design palette. We had a session this afternoon about our palette of trees in the city, so I think they should be there. Now, I think just in this situation where there's only two of them left, they've only got five years, and they are a bit like that, they're not the really state. If it was some of those in Childers Street, some magnificent stately ones, which I'd be dying in the ditch to say no, but um, I think given these two ones left aren't particularly great specimens, um, I'd uh, err on the side of supporting the 27 as opposed to the 10 uh, residents who are supporting that. Thank moment. you, Councillor Wilkinson. Any further debate about 15.1? Councillor Mark. Just a question, Lord Mayor, and I hesitate to ask, but do we have a policy about trees of uneven height in squares, and do we have a policy about trees of uneven height in the parklands, and are they different? See you. Clinton, would you have any response to that? I'm not, sure. I'm not aware we do have a policy. Tom? Tom's going to say no, I think. Through you, Lord Mayor, there's no policy in relation to the actual scale and size of tree. And actually, we try to, uh, where possible, plant semi mature trees, but they have various rates of growth. Um, Rundle Mall being an example, we start with small trees, we've got significant trees, so the answer is no. Members, no further debate. I hand you back to the mover, Councillor. Councillor Hender, you'd like to I, I discuss? Briefly, Thank you, Councillor Corbett. I, I did just want to talk briefly just to support Councillor Antic's motion. Uh, in my view, there are times when, when you know in doing your own garden work that you uh, sacrifice something, uh, one or two elements 
in order to um, get a cohesive and coherent and elegant look um, across the larger uh, vista. I think that's all we're doing here. We're just sacrificing two trees in order to get a better result, get a better long-term result. We're about better long-term results. I think we're doing that all over the city, actually. We very rarely make a choice to pull trees out. And I, in, in my view, it makes sense to do it here, and I support them. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Antic, back to you to sum up. Just very quickly, thank you, um, Councillor Hinder. I think it's channeling the words of um, Kenny Rogers, the gambler, when he said you have to know where to hold them and you have to know where to fold them. There. And that's very much the case here. Is anyone familiar with that? Oh, good. Excellent. Um, so, touching on that briefly, um, look, can I just to allay further fears? Um, th there is no one across the street. In fact, you have to cross three streets to find the neighbours because there is uh, the street, the square, the street, and another street. So, you know, the people in this building are the people that really are bearing the brunt of this. Uh, so, um, it is a matter of aesthetics. Uh, they are trees that will grow very, very quickly and no doubt soak up all the carbon of their predecessors, so uh, for which we will all be better. So there we are. Thank you. On that note, Councillor, thank you. Members, I put this matter before you, 15.1. Those in favour? Those against? 15.1 carried. Item 15.2, Councillor Abia, motion on notice, Chinatown, Chinese New Year celebration, page 117. Councillor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, I move this motion in my name and I seek a <coughs> seconder as printed before I speak to it. Members, I look to the floor for a seconder. Councillor Hander, the floor is yours, Councillor Abia. Thank you, Councillor Hander. Uh, look, Lord Mayor, firstly, I'd like to apologise to elected members uh, for the volume of motions that have come through on this. This was from the previous uh, council. There was a couple of motions also that are still in here that were put in a few weeks back that just didn't make it through the council agenda, so my apologies. Uh, but look, with regards to this, I've read the council administration uh, comments, and if the administration feels and the council feels today that they don't want to support this through this process, then I would ask the administration uh, to look at a way to assist the precinct group um, to apply for funding through the current process of, main, of, the, uh, of the Main Street um, Advancement uh, Grant. Um, if that could be facilitated, assisted, obviously different communities don't know what we sort of do and how, how we do it as a council. Uh, but I think the other note that I want to uh, denote here, I think we really need to look at the Chinatown precinct and the China, Chinese New Year in a completely different light as an event. I know we try to treat it as a precinct group funding process, but if this city wants to grow that activity, uh, wants to connect more people to it, if that is not the designated location for it, it needs to go somewhere else, et cetera, I do denote in the report that if there's a request by council, a report on ways to improve and add value to the Lunar New Year event can be prepared. I'd like to see something like that uh, because I really think it's a very important cultural um, event for the city, uh, connects our community, brings a lot of people from outside the city. And I'll be honest with you, I just don't think, given the amount of red tape that's involved and also the challenges around the requirements of police, the street closures and everything else that's happening, that this community group specifically is able to leverage their skill set without a significant support to be able to put on this event. Especially given to um, given, I guess, to what's happened recently in Chinatown um, and the fire that's occurred, we just need to rally a little bit behind the community and try to support them. And I think it'll be a great way to do it through the Chinese New Year. So I'm going to leave it here, Lord Mayor, because I've already spoken about this, and I would leave it uh, in the hands of the chamber to make a decision on how they'd like to move forward with that. Thank you, Councillor Abia. Councillor Hendy, you second the motion. Do you care to speak to it? Right, Members, I look to the floor. Councillor Clarehan. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, and I do acknowledge that um, in organising such a, a large event, uh, there is a requirement to have plenty of lead time. However, reading this report, it says that they're yet to equip the loan, the um, grant or loan that they were given from the previous year. Uh, and also the question is, how much have they received to date? Because it looks like They've already um, they've been invited to apply for twenty thousand. Uh, then there's been a, a pre-commit. Uh, sorry, they've um, got fifteen thousand allocated from the events and festival sponsorship fund. And now they're asking, or Councillor Abiyad's motion is to ask for another fifteen on top of that. 
We'll seek clarification. So just so the CEO is clear, you're looking for clarification around the status of the acquittal report and you're looking for update with regards to additional funding. CEO? Ian, can you respond? To yeah, through you, Lord Mayor. Um, so they have received $15,000 and uh, we are looking at the round now for the mainstream advancement grants is open again, open until the 2nd of August, as per the note here. Uh, in order to qualify, you do need to quit from the previous year. So we've been in communication with the group around doing that acquittal. Um, if that acquittal was forthcoming, then they're eligible for the grant round. Um, I just could I seek clarification from Councillor Abiyad, please? Is he aware of the fact that 15 has been allocated? They're eligible for 20 once they acquit the um, the loan from la or the grant from last year. Are we looking for how much in total? Can I Thank you, you. Councillor. Just um, answer this as a question. I'll continue on the debate, and then I'll send you back for a sum up. But if you can answer, the yeah, question, sure, it will be answered as a question. So what I'm requesting here is, if they were to get the fifteen thousand, they wouldn't be getting the twenty thousand. So it would be they won't go through that process. They weren't going through this process initially. So they received fifteen instead of twenty. And what I was asking for is a further fifteen, <laughs> which makes it a total of thirty thousand. If they go through this process at fifteen, which they've already received. If this is declined today, then they'll go and get the 20 if they're acquitted through that process. But if they did receive the 15,000, they won't go through that process. So we actually pick up $5,000. And that's what I said last time. But it's upfront guarantee. That's okay, so members, are you clear on that? Yeah. Councillor Hendy, you had a question? Um, not a question, Lord Mayor. I just um, wanted to speak to the motion. You reserved, yes, you did. Of course, you can. You may. Um, and I've asked um, Councillor Abbey whether he'd prepared, be prepared to have this motion taken in parts. Um, the reason for that is that uh, my I'm happy to my support of it was for the motion was particularly in relation to the second part of the motion, and that is that we get a report on how we might better leverage this event. I agree with Councillor Abbey that this is an event that actually could be a really significant landmark event in our city's calendar. I don't think it's ever really lived up to its potential. I know there's been some real you know, difficulties and I know the administration have worked extremely hard, um, but I, I, I still have um, confidence that uh, with the right people in place, we could actually turn this into a landmark city event and I'd be, I'm very keen that that happened. Um, I, I suspect that when Councillor Abbey had presented this um, initially, given that it's been on the books for a while coming through, circumstances were different, so things have changed a bit since the motion was first uh, presented um, to our um, secretariat. Um, so perhaps um, the first paragraph is not so essential if there's another mechanism for them to get the money, but the second paragraph I think is essential and, and I'd like to see a report on how we might turn this thing into something that really counts. Thank you, members. We will vote on this matter in parts. Now, members, do I have any further debate? I don't see a show of hands, so I'm going to take you back to your mover, Councillor Abiyad. Councillor Abiyad, to sum up. Thank you, Lord Mayor, just in summing up. Um, look, I, I remember the term of council prior to this one, we were supporting this event at the tune of about 50000 a year to be able to put it on. Um, we've done that twice um, in two occasions where we've supported the event. There were street closures, etc. But ever since then, it's always been the numbers been about 20,000 that have supported the event. Um, I know we apply the seed, fun uh, seed funding thinking when it comes to some of those events for them to stand on their own two feet. This community hasn't been able to do that. So, so even to go down from the $20,000, which is initially given, back to 15 is a better charge. Uh, last year, they were successful and they were acquitted. Councillor Clarehan through a process where they picked up further funding. So last year, they got 40,000, I believe, in funding, 20,000 from the project and another 20,000 through the program. This would have seen them get 30,000. So that's what I was trying to do. And when I moved the motion, there wasn't a process in place for the community um, to go back through that process and get it. So now that they've done that, hopefully we wish them every bit of success in the process to get a good outcome. Um, but I'd ask members to support the motion because I do think it leaves council in a better financial position, but it does guarantee it. However, I'm happy for them to go through the process now that they're clear on the process. Uh, but I would still like, as Councillor Hender mentioned, for us to at least have the opportunity to reach the Chinese New Year for the benefit of the city from an economic and social perspective. Uh, I mean, you know, look at all Asia, Lord Mayor, some of the stuff that's coming out of that is quite incredible. Uh, so I think there's an opportunity there that should be missed. Thank you, Councillor Abiyad. So members, we're taking this in parts. I will look to you to first vote on part one. Those in favour? 
members, can I see your hands please? Those in favour of part one? Those against part one? Part one carries. Okay. Members, I now look to you on part two. Those in favour of part two? Those against part two? Part two <coughs> carries. Thank you, members. That is item 15.2 dealt with. Item 15.3, Councillor Abiyad, motion on notice, Main Street Precinct Group support as printed, page 119. Councillor? Again, look, that uh, was a motion that was put a few weeks back uh, with regards to the precinct groups. Uh, Lord Mayor, precinct groups, as we all know, are a group of volunteers that are engaged in our community. They're very active volunteers in the community, and I feel, really think there's an opportunity there for us um, sorry, did I we'll get a second? I'll we'll look for a second, Councillor. Councillor Corbell Moore, back to you, Councillor Abia. Um, and look, the intent of the motion here, Lord Mayor, is to really revise that model to look at ways we can better assist our precinct groups, uh, whether it being through financial support, a resourcing support, etc., which is really important. I find that a lot of the precinct groups tend to replicate a lot of their processes. Um, they all tend to get a coordinator on part-time, tend to pay some of the coordinators. Some of their coordinators, obviously, are volunteers. They don't get paid. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I really think there's an opportunity for us, given the digital discussions we're having, smart city discussion we're having, that we can try to centralise some of the services for them, but give them a CMS website so they don't have to pay for hosting every single one of them, they don't have to register a domain for every single one of them, that there's opportunities there for us to see them spend the 20000 they're getting or the $25,000 they're getting um, better spent on street start, street activation and other things that they would want to do instead of that cost going towards an administrative cost. Um, so I think it's important that through that process we're able to revise that. And the other reason I'm bringing this up is there's been new precinct groups that are coming out uh, that are getting engaged and it'll be important for us to understand how do we formalise a, a, a precinct group approach. I've heard from uh, previous um, members of the public saying, well, you know, if we want to start a precinct group, how do we do that? Is there an application? How do we get recognised by council? Um, how do we get the funding, et cetera, et cetera. So I really think it would be really good for us to understand how all that works. Uh, I know there's a group of uh, retailers on Melbourne Street that met with me about five weeks ago. They were really keen on getting something started on Melbourne Street. Um, they're newcomers to the street. So I think there's a lot of opportunities there for us to try to assist those groups. Uh, and I think this motion would really deliver on that. Um, it's really important that we also do it in consultation with those groups, with the precinct groups, to see what their needs are. Because some of their needs are very similar when it comes to coordination, um, you know, IT, et cetera, et cetera. But some of the other needs might be completely different. So I think through that process, we'll be able to formalise something moving forward uh, to potentially look at resourcing, finance, uh, potential new models, and also how do we get new people involved uh, as new precinct groups arise around the city, uh, I think it will be important to, for us to try this system. Uh, that's how simple it is. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Corbett Moore, you seconded. Do you wish to speak to the matter? Just briefly, um, agreeing with everything that Councillor <coughs> Abiyad has said, I think the best place is to take it to a workshop and get the administration um, to write us that report <coughs> and seek our guidance on how we want to move forward. Um, I'm in particular would like our administration to prepare some information around business improvement districts and for that to be brought to the workshop um, for our precinct groups. Thank you, councillors. Members, any further debate? Councillor Martin. Yeah, Lord Mayor, I'd like to move um, an amendment to that, please. Certainly, Councillor. Can you please read the amendment out slowly and we'll be capturing it? Yeah, sure. Um, Lord Mayor, if I can just uh, alert members to the uh, motion at 15.9, which was lodged on notice. And so uh, to spare the Chamber another discussion about the same subject, I'm proposing an amendment which would incorporate that. Um, and the amendment is that Council 1 requests the administration increases the 2018-19 grant to each Main Street group by 3,000, that's to 28,000, and funds the increase from any surplus arising in the 2018-19 QF1 or QF2 financial reports to asks for a workshop to consider other means of supporting Main Street groups, including details of how business improvement districts could be established in the City of Adelaide. Now, I emphasise, Lord Mayor, that this is already in the motions on notice at 15.9. 
And so as we're talking about the same subject, that is, I have notified that money increase previously on notice at 15.9, I am proposing uh, an amendment. And Councillor uh, Wilkinson has seconded that. Councillor, I will allow it. Do you have a second? Councillor Wilkinson, you wish to debate the merits of it? Yeah, thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, um, uh, Councillor Abia is a great supporter of the uh, Main Street groups. I acknowledge that. It was he who moved um, for the uh, precinct groups to be brought into the Christmas in the city promotion. And uh, he too, who uh, coined the term that the uh, precinct groups were the, uh, the foot soldiers of the local economies. Uh, and while a funding report would be useful, it is, in fact, additional funds that the groups require to make up for the, uh, the real loss in spending power that they've suffered as a result of not having received an increase from 2012-13, I think was the last one. Uh, in fact, that information was supplied by the administration to uh, a question on notice last week. Now, the irony is that while their money hasn't increased, our charges to them have. Uh, we're constantly approving annual increases in fees for permits, in fees for events and things of that nature. And so while they're getting less money from Council, Council is charging them more and has been since 2012-13. Now, uh, sure, there's a competitive fund available. It's the, uh, the Main Street um, Improvement Fund, but that's competitive. And so one and two groups, I think it was three last year, got something out of it, but the rest did not. This actually would help all of the funds uh, to do what they need. And indeed, the precinct group presidents, as a group, have written to all councillors in the past week and asked that their uh, funds be increased to 30,000, whereas I'm proposing here 28,000, which is what it would have been had the amount increased every year just by 1.9%. Now, uh, we have the savings. Uh, I, I know uh, it will be argued that there's a new cost associated with the reformed Hutt Street Group, uh, and that's fine, and I support that. But I, I point out that for many years, those funds have been unspent. In fact, the precinct groups have wondered why it hasn't been distributed to them. But be that as it may, they are, without exception, doing a great job in very difficult circumstances. And this, I think, will help them, I hope, and it will help all groups across the city, not just one, all groups across the city. And at the same time, it achieves, I know what Councillor Abbott is looking for, that's a broader discussion about how we can help them. And I note the administration's uh, comments about business improvement districts. They are very successful, and there are great examples of them working well in places like Western Australia. It would be useful to have the administration conduct a workshop addressing those issues and particularly about the legislative impediments here in South Australia. We have actually had some workshops on these matters. Um, in fact, doing some research, we had four in 2015, four workshops on how to assist <coughs> these precinct groups. Now, uh, Lord Mayor, I would hope that everyone uh, would support this. It is for no particular benefit politically to anyone in this place. It is of benefit to all of the precinct groups, and I'd urge everyone to support that. They are doing a great job. The least we can do is ensure that they have what they would have been getting if we'd have just given them the inflationary increase each year. In fact, 1.9% added uh, on a compound basis is actually less than the real rate of inflation. And I think you'll find it's uh, less than the charge. Uh, the charges have increased uh, at Adelaide City Council over that same period. Thank you, Councillor. Now the CEO would like to make a brief word. I'm then going to look to Councillor Wilkinson, the Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Abiyan, and Councillor Moran. CEO. Yeah, three, Lord Mayor. Just to provide certainty with this motion, um, I think it's important that um, you understand we cannot absolutely predict a surplus. So I would suggest. A better wording would be that we simply fund the increase through QF1. Just make it clear. Um, you don't need to then link it to a surplus or otherwise. Thanks. Should the amendment pass? Yes. I'll leave you to contemplate that. Try to your sum up. Oh, uh, thanks, Lord Mayor. I, I'm guided by the administration, whatever they'd prefer. Okay. Yes. Okay. So I'll take. Can I ask you 
Jake, Jake, your question. Uh, Council Mayor, can I keep going? Because we'll get to our second. Oh, I, I, will, I, will, a, I will come to you. Well, procedurally, this is, a, this is a motion without notice. No, it's a motion without notice. It's on notice. No, no it's it? not. No, it's, it's not. Well, you've just bumped out the motion. How, how can no. that be an acceptable. Um, Councillor, I have deemed this acceptable. I did contemplate that. This was a motion on notice by Councillor Martin further down the agenda. It is a similar subject. It may not be precisely the same, but it is a similar, sub similar subject. Members, you have, an you, you have an opportunity here to vote for it or vote against it. That is up to you, but I'm going to continue the debate. Councillor Wilkinson, you seconded the um, amendment. Yes, no, I um, seconded this motion because um, I've been aware in my time on council how the funding to these precinct groups has been, in real terms, being decreased by not being indexed to inflation, and yet their costs are not are not are not uh, stagnating. Their costs are going up. So um, I agree that those precinct groups and um, uh, need the, the funding that we're providing them needs to track with inflation. And so it's um, it's an eminently sensible uh, uh, thing to uh, to make this increase, just so it's tracking with inflation, just so they've got the, the same spending. Uh, capability, and I also applaud some of the uh, initiatives that Councillor Abiad was uh, uh, referring to in terms of uh, um, pooling some of their resources, so they're not having to all do their own little bit like that. So that should also help them extend their uh, extend their uh, 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 the, the effectiveness of the funding that Council's providing in support of these groups. Thank you, members. You are debating an amendment, Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, look, I, I um, am really struggling with this. I am very supportive of the original motion of Councillor Albiard um, because that is a workshop so we can actually talk through the way that we can support the Main Street um, precinct groups. Um, and as Councillor Abiad said, it's it's broader than just financial support. It's actually how we can, you know, resource them and actually combine the support so that all of the individual little pockets of money just don't go to administration for those those um, precinct groups. Um, so I probably won't vote for this. I'm assuming if this doesn't get up that motion that uh, Councillor Martin's motion on notice 15.9 will still come through the chamber? I'm presuming it won't. No. If this gets up, it won't. Okay. If right. this does not, we'll deal with that later. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Uh, Councillor Abiad, followed by Councillor Moran. Um, Lord Mayor, just to speak, I speak against this. I mean, this does wipe out um, what I did intend in my motion and it replaces it with Councillor Martin's motion. I don't think throwing money at it is going to fix it. Um, and I think the challenges are much bigger than that because resourcing is a very important component. And I think one of the things that we really need to look at from an administrative perspective, and I do support a big model, I do support all those models that we can bring in. They work in some areas, not in other areas, and I'm familiar with them. But, but I think the one thing here that we're saying is we may end up with a result. We may end up with a report that comes back to council saying, let's increase by CPI, let's give them some catch up money, let's work out how we're going to fund it because there isn't, or there may or may not be a surplus as part of the quarter uh, review process. We may end up with this result, but let's do it in an educated form where we're able to get all the information we need to reassess the model. I think our precinct groups deserve more than $3,000. I think they deserve some seriously good support. I don't think they need to go through a, an application process through a Main Street Advancement Program. I think they need to be well resourced. I, I think they need to be given $30,000, $40,000 a year each if they're delivering outcomes as part of the strategic plan for council. In essence, they are delivery arms for council, so they save us the money anyway. Uh, instead of going out to contractors, instead of going out to other groups to do the work, we could potentially give them more, do more with them uh, to create the city we want to create and to get the outcomes we're after. So I think, Lord Mayor, I would ask members to not support this motion because I do think that through that process, uh, we are able to still get a similar outcome, get a decent report and have a better understanding to how we can support those groups. Uh, $3,000 is not going to go a very long way uh, without the resources. It's going to disappear overnight. 
I agree that they should probably get discounts with council uh, services, potentially. This, this might be something that we look at as part of our model and how we assist them in trying to get also um, better outcomes with SA police and other security measures that they need to have when they're looking at street closures and other things that we could do to try to save them costs. Um, I just don't think throwing money at it right now is going to be the solution. So I'd ask members to not support this motion and to <laughs> back to the other, sorry. Uh, I'm guessing this is an amendment? Yes, okay. So I ask members to not support this amendment and to let it default back to the original, which will give us all the information we need to get a better outcome and to get a long-term style of support that we can provide for the precinct groups and help them achieve all the outcomes they want to achieve. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Moran, followed by Councillor Hinder, followed by Councillor Milani. Councillor Moran. Well, I just totally endorse what Councillor Vershaw and Councillor Abriad said. Um, we may well give them more money, but we have to um, we have to take take a step at a time. I was perfectly happy with um, Councillor Abiad's original motion, and I wasn't going to vote for the, the other motion, so um, I won't be voting for the amendment. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Uh, Councillor Hinder, followed by Councillor Milani. I have nothing to add, Lord Mayor, sorry. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Milani. Uh, Lord Mayor, look, I echo that. You know, I think it was Einstein that said to spend 95% of time on the problem and, and the solution will come. So I think um, um, fix, look at the, um, the problem um, and ultimately the solution will, you know, it could be a slightly different solution that is what's actually required. Thank you, Councillor. So, members, do I have any further debate on the amendment? I don't see any hands. I take you back to the mover of the amendment, Councillor Martin. Well, thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, I remind everyone that this is something that the precinct associations, every president wrote to every councillor about, asking for an increase to $30,000 to compensate for money that was lost through not having their money indexed. So, I propose that it's indexed and they get $3,000 a year each extra. Now, that is not as much as uh, you think. It is, in fact, um, a really positive way in which we can help them. Uh, a report commissioned from the administration will lead to a workshop, which will be held in the dying days of the council, and some would say those are pretty close, and then perhaps the next council might consider it. And at some stage, perhaps next year or the year after it'll come, this is a concrete proposal to give them the money that will bring them up to what they would have received had it been indexed. And we had no difficulty in reaching in a fairly educated way a decision to give Chinatown $15,000 for their Lunar New Year party. But we can't come up with a similar amount for all of the precincts across Adelaide, even though they've written to us and asked for it even though they are the foot soldiers of our local economies. It seems to me that it's not a big stretch, it's not a big ask, uh, and uh, I, I, I think you'll find they'll be bitterly <laughs> disappointed if this chamber says no to such a small amount of money, while this council considers all of the options open to it, as has been the case for the last three years. We could have been discussing all of the ways to support them, Instead, we just left their dough as it was, unindexed, and now we want to have a report that's not going to surface or have any impact till the next council. I, look, I just beg everyone, do the right thing, the decent thing, and give them what they would have got if it had been indexed. So, members, I put the amendment as moved by Councillor Martin before you. Those in favour? Those against? Division. The amendment fails. Those members voting in favour of the amendment, please rise. Councillor Wilkinson, Councillor Corbell Moore, Councillor Martin, Councillor Kerrigan. So I declared against. Members, I now take you back to the principal debate on the principal motion. So do I have any further members who wish to speak to the principal motion who have not already spoken to the principal motion? I don't. Councillor Abiyad, you are summing up on the principal motion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Lord Mayor. Look, I know this is um, a very passionate topic for all the elected members, um, and I know that every elected member thinks very highly of our precinct groups, and supporting our precinct groups is really important. And I think part of this process, it's really important to note that every sponsorship grant application, everything we put out, does not have any indexation with it. 
We, we don't have that process in place. And it may be that this report, maybe this process that we undergo will take into account with precinct group support that there will be an indexation and that'll be part of our policy. So to have an expectation from council that there's an indexation process in place whilst there isn't is a problem because then every single sponsor application for council from a grants perspective, they may also expect the same. And look, I think through a bid model, through a different process, through resource allocation, everything that we may do, we may still achieve a similar outcome. And I think the only thing I want to ask our administration to do is, please, let's try to do this as quickly as we can to try to pull something back through to council to assist where we can. I think that will be really important. And it doesn't have to be just in financial need uh, means it might be something that you reach out to now to the precinct groups and say look what are some of the challenges you're having what are some of the cost impediments that you're having and how can we help you remove those costs to assist you in the immediate um, in the immediate future so I'd ask members to support this motion and uh, I'll leave it there Lord Mayor. members I put this motion before you those in favor those against the motion carried Members, item 15.4, Councillor Aviar, motion on notice properties with rate exclusion, page 121. Councillor. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'll move the motion and seek a seconder. Councillor Wilkinson is your seconder. The floor is yours, Councillor. Um, Lord Mayor, this is a, something that's been on my mind for quite some time, and I've been trying to work on it over the last 12 months. Um, it's really come to mind that as our city grows, uh, obviously we're not growing past the boundaries of our pockets. Um, and the only opportunity for us to have a growth in our income is through our business, uh, which we do now. And obviously, hopefully, without an increase in the rate of the dollar, we're able to leverage new rates in the city of Adelaide and be uh, able to do that through planning that we've seen change and trigger the development of apartments in the city. But the one thing that I think is really important for us to understand is who is excluded from paying rates in the city and how they're currently operating in that sphere. Um, some of the things that we need to take into account are obviously the Crown, the universities, community housing providers, community social services, religious groups and others are, are excluded from any rateable base uh, through uh, this mechanism uh, with the City of Adelaide. Um, some of those organisations, Lord Mayor, uh, may by all means need that uh, rate relief and they may, may need that support uh, because of the type of service they provide. But it's something that we need to build within our policy and long-term financial plan. And I'll give you an example. Anyone that's excluded from paying rates in the city can go and acquire more rateable properties in the city of Adelaide and then deem them excluded from being rateable. And I want to understand what the impact of that is on this council because we're not growing past our park rates. So I think there's an opportunity there for understand, to understand better how we could create opportunities and partnerships between us and potentially some of those groups uh, to try to leverage better city outcomes, uh, especially if the acquisition of such sites that we used to get rates for, we're not getting anymore as a result of this specific process. So we should understand the impact of that. We should understand what the impact would look like over a 10 year, 20 year, 50 year period, because potentially we will run out of space eventually <laughs> in the city of Adelaide. Um, and the more acquisitions are happening under a rate exclusion mechanism, would have a negative impact on this council's long-term long financial plan. So um, I would ask for this report to come through for us to have a better understanding and to map out some of those discussions um, and some of the stuff that we're talking about here with the report will also include estimates around foregone rates and potential new rates. I mean, we're seeing control of the Riverbank precinct, for example, medical precinct, convention centre, all that stuff is coming up. If we're having to maintain main streets, if we're having to manage main streets, full path and provide better services and public amenities, who is paying for that? Because there are people that are excluded paying for it and there are people that aren't excluded. And I think it's important for this council to know how that all works and if people are excluded for the right reasons or entities are excluded for the right reasons because we can justify social return, cultural return, economic return of other means, that is fine. It will remain to be the case. But if it isn't, this council needs to be aware of that. Thank you, Councillor. Your seconder was Councillor Wilkinson. Do you wish to speak to this matter, Councillor? Thank you, Lord Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Abia, for putting up this motion. Um, historically, universities were not-for-profit organisations. There was a fundamental shift when the federal government changed the funding model for universities to they are now private company organisations and the University of Adelaide and the University of South Australia would be two of the biggest and wealthiest corporations in the city of Adelaide. 
University of Adelaide and built a massive 15 storey office building on the parklands where there used to be a skate park, um, yet they pay no rates. It seems absurd to me that since that change in federal um, funding of the universities that they still enjoy the same rate exemption that uh, the Anglican Church does, which is basically getting money from people at their congregation by, by contrast. So um, certainly I think the universities, I would have on my side that they should be paying rates because they um, are operating on a very commercial basis. I've got friends who work in the university system and know how, how they ruthlessly deal with their own staff in terms of extracting every last dollar and, and things like that. So they're acting in an entirely corporate manner uh, and, and shouldn't be getting the largest of a rate. Of that. Also, um, Councillor Abiat's comment about the acquisition of sites which then become rate, uh, rate exempt is a little bit like the colleges and institutions where they can buy a property and then have their special planning rules applied to the property that they purchase is manifestly unfair. And in the city of Fremantle, the universities down there have been purchasing properties and then sitting on them. And so formerly vibrant parts of Fremantle have been sterilised by university acquisitions of vast tracts of Fremantle, for example, if you go there and have a look. So um, that's an example of it. And, uh, and they would be being exempted from rates. So uh, they're actually getting a, a financial advantage over other people who might have otherwise bought those properties because they get the rates exemption. So thank you, Councillor Abbey. Thank you, Councillor Members. Do I have any further debate about this matter? Councillor Martin, followed by Councillor Clare. Yeah, look, uh, Lord Mayor, just before I make a decision about whether I support this or not, I, I, I'm just trying to get a handle on why it is that we're getting this information and what, what it will enable us to do. I mean, what's the action that follows having all of this information? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm happy to ask you, uh, Councillor Adams. I'll accept that as a question to the mover. I guess we'll come back to the next council. I hope I'll be here. I hope Councillor Martin won't. <laughs> and we'll deal with it. <laughs> that's how simple it should look like. Decorum, please, members. Decorum. I mean, that's that's incredibly offensive. And look, I, I really think it's a it's wonderful a thing that people can it's actually show, see yeah, what we're dealing show. with here. Um, look, I, you know, I appreciate that uh, Councillor Abbey has been uh, contemplative, and uh, I'm sorry it's happening so late in the term of council to have had that depth of thought earlier on would have been great. But I, I can't help feeling that um, it's a bit like asking why does the sun come up in the morning, and then assigning the administration to investigate it. Uh, that is the law. Commonwealth and state properties are exempt from local taxes. That is it. Happens in Adelaide, it happens in every city in Australia, uh, happens in most parts of the world. Um, uh, you know, I, I wish it was different, but there's just no point in asking for a report about it. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Councillor Clarehan. Look, I think there is value in asking for a report because, as uh, Councillor Wilkinson mentioned, there was a time when the majority of these that are listed here were not for profit and were definitely focused on community services. And I think that the, there has been a change in the way that the uh, revenue is collected and the way the businesses are run. And even as far as community housing providers, I think it's been brought to the attention of councillors previously that this is the perfect example of cost shifting between state and local government. And it's got nothing to do with, with political parties. Um, we've had a change of government and the other one was guilty of it as much as this one might be. So, you know, I think it's, it's a necessity that we actually see on that one hand, what is happening to our rate revenue um, or potential rate revenue. We're getting squeezed from above from federal <coughs> in that we're not getting the same grants that local government used to receive. It's nearly halved over the last 15 years. And then we've got the state government handballing responsibilities onto local government and in the same breath saying, oh, but you know, you've got to be more accountable for the revenue. You've got to cap your revenue. So I think these are very reasonable questions to be asked and we are being transparent. Let's be more transparent. Thank you, Councillor. No further debate. I take you back to the mover, Councillor Abiyan. Well, just quickly sum up, uh, uh, Lord Mayor. I think it's um, what we're asking for, which is really important um, with regards to this information, 
I know there are things around the law we can't change, but we just need to brace ourselves for the impacts because the one thing we need to understand, if any of those exclusions, and I haven't pointed a specific entity out um, here, any that anyone that's excluded as an entity from this, the more land they acquire in the city of Adelaide, the more challenging it would be for us to be able to service those streets, to service the roads off the same rateable base, because for every time they do an acquisition, we lose a rateable property. And that's what, I'm more, that's what I want to brace ourselves to. We might not be able to change the rules, and that's probably what, uh, not potentially what we're looking to do, but we're looking at ways to manage our long-term financial plan better by understanding the long-term impact uh, of what some of those entities will be doing in the city of Adelaide and how it will impact our bottom line. That's what it's about. Uh, and I think if we're able to do that better, we can mitigate it better. And potentially, if they understand what the impact is, they may also want to co-contribute or work with us on public ramp upgrades, potential improvements to their areas, because then they can recognise what sort of impact this is having on their city. Most, if not all, of those entities, Lord Mayor, are community-style services entity. And their best interest, what, what would be in their best interest at any given time is the community. It is. That's what they do. Whether they're education institutions, religious institutions, or non-for-profit institutions, Crown, all of them have the they have the, they should have <laughs> the best interest of the community at heart. I think being transparent through this process will show the level of impact they have on the right pays of the city of Adelaide as well. And as a result, hopefully there will be some partnerships forged or at least some better education moving forward. Thank you, Councillor Abiad. Members, I put item 15.4 before you before consideration. Those in favour, those against. Item 15.4 carried. And members, can I commend you on the quality of your debate? The Small Business Commissioner has chosen to spend his Tuesday night with us. We thank you, sir. Uh, members, item 15.5, Councillor Abiyad, motion on notice, Dockless Bike Sharing, page 122. Councillor Abiyad. Um, Lord Mayor, again, apologies for elected members that all this has come at once. Um, you have a second in Councillor Mulani, so you can commence I'm happy to be very brief. Members would have probably seen some aspects of this in the public. We know um, there's been a transaction uh, between OFO and Bike SA uh, with regards to approximately about 450 bikes that they've acquired. They are looking for opportunities to potentially partner or support. Uh, the city of Adelaide, um, and I think there's a great opportunity there for us to solve a pretty big problem. Uh, if we're able to assist those groups in retrofitting any of those bikes to not be hung on trees, to be hung in specific uh, soft, uh, softly applied locations around the city of Mayor, uh, where we can take the infrastructure off, put it on, etc., where some of those bikes can be docked, uh, I think we'll save a pretty big problem. And at the same time, we'll, uh, we'll be able to solve a pretty big, we'll have a pretty big solution for uh, city commuters and users and rate pays as well in the city of Adelaide. So I think this is a great initiative. I do um, congratulate Bike SA on the leadership that they've taken through that process by uh, taking lead, speaking to OFO and having that discussion with them early on. They have taken some significant risk in doing that. Uh, but I, th I think at the same time, I think there's a great opportunity there because if this is a community style hybrid model uh, where we're able to support it, imagine the level of data this council will be able to get. It will take completely the guesswork out of any bike rider in the city of Adelaide that is using those 450 bikes. Uh, we'll be able to start mapping information, data, know where some of the popular streets are, where is the favourite route for some of those uh, bike users. Um, of some of the bike users, which I think is really important. I think where, where the value is for the city is in the data. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Milani, a second. Just briefly, I, I support this, um, and it's interesting because, um, you know, this um, mobility mania, as we call it, is a global phenomenon, but it's not happening in our own backyard in terms of bike sharing. Um, uh, Uber just bought um, a large bike sharing company called Lime for um, over 300 million. Um, Lyft, which is Uber's competitor, bought the competitor to Lime for 335 million. All of these companies are investing in bike sharing. Scooter sharing is now part of the conversation. It's all now combined on the. Um, it'll become um, combined on the apps of the Ubers and the Lyfts of the world. So what it says is there's a global movement around the way we move around the city and there's an opportunity um, for us to be part of it. It's disappointing that 
the bike sharing companies moved out of Adelaide and Australia for a range of different reasons. And may I say, I think we all saw some appalling for, um, examples of vandalism when it came to the bike sharing, you know, the infrastructure that they had. So um, I, I'd like to think that we're better than that, but it is certainly um, an industry we need to be a part of, we need to be a conversation of. Um, and, um, and I urge um, us to be proactive in this space and that you all support this motion. Thank you, Councillor Mullaney. Any further comments, members? Councillor Martin. Yeah, look, I, I, I'm a bit shocked, Lord Mayor, because it was Councillor Aviat who was urging us to get out of bikes only a few months ago when it came to assessing the, uh, the program that the City of Adelaide funded jointly with uh, Bike SA. And now we're getting back into it. But the simple fact is that since this motion was lodged, Bike SA has bought the entire fleet of OFO bikes and intends to mount its own operation in the city of Adelaide. And I say good luck to them. I think uh, you know entrepreneurship is a wonderful thing. And when somebody else is in that space, then I don't think local government ought to be moving into it to provide competition. And that's the way Councillor Abia thought uh, recently, but not tonight. So. I, I think there's a problem there, a fundamental problem in the ideology. I think it would be better if the council did not become involved in this and did not waste the administration's time in exercising their minds about whether this model or that model or any other model will work when the private sector, a community-based group, is out there creating a service. It has the bikes, let them do it. Councillor, members, any further debate? Councillor Abia. Uh, Lord Mayor, I've worked on this motion in conjunction with Bike SA, and they actually love it. Um, and uh, Christian Haag um, was very supportive of what we're trying to do to assist him. So I engaged with my community, Lord Mayor, when I put my motions up and with the administration, because it's really important that they come on board when we're making moves like this. I've never encouraged the council to completely remove itself from bikes. I said that whilst there's private operators in the city of Adelaide, that council shouldn't interfere with a private operation um, and that we should excuse ourselves from the market and let OFO and OBike run the market and see how they go. I acknowledge both companies that went through uh, some challenging times in making the business model work, but good on them for trying. They've tried something in our city and we should acknowledge uh, the fact that an international company has come to our city to give something a go. Uh, not everything works, but at least they've tried. Most people don't try. And I think it's something that needs to be acknowledged. So uh, I think through this motion, uh, which like I said, was done in conjunction with uh, Bike SA, we'll be able to assist them, look at their model, see how we can assist in retrofitting, sponsorship, monitoring data on bikes, and adding value to the bike rider in the city of Adelaide. They will be able through some of the entrepreneurship stuff in the back end to push data to bike riders on sales, what's on sale in the city, what coffee shops are providing discounts, a whole heap of things can be done with this, which is absolutely incredible. So I'd ask members to support this motion and uh, I look forward to a favourable outcome for our city. Thank you, councillors. So members, I put item 15.5 before you. Those in favour? Those against? Item 15.5 is carried. I take you to 15.6. Councillor Moran, motion on notice, building developments in the city. Uh, Councillor Maloney is excusing herself from the chamber. She did pre-advise me that she had to leave at eight o'clock. Thank you, councillor. Uh, Lord Mayor, um, with your indulgence, I would like to uh, put this on notice for the next council meeting as I have further information that I'm gathering and I want to make some minor changes that I can't do tonight to the motion. Thank you for advising your fellow members, Councillor Moran. I appreciate it. So, members, I will take you to item 15.8. My mistake, item 15.7. Deputy Lord Mayor, motion on notice, phasing out plastic drinking stores. DLM. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'd like to uh, move this motion and seek a seconder. Councillor Hender had a hand up first. DLM, floor is yours. Thank you. Um, Lord Mayor, there, there has been a lot of chat about uh, waste of, of, of late, um, but I will draw uh, the Chamber's attention to the fact that the Council held the Sustainable Events Industry Workshop uh, at the beginning of May, 
uh, for which I was actually um, the speaker and opened the workshop, um, partly because of the work that I've done in festivals and events over many, many years, and in particular the work that I was part of with Why Madelaide, uh, which is an event that um, has been best practiced for many, many years and controls its waste streams and has reduced its landfill uh, year after year until it's, it's almost neg negligible. Um, the City of Adelaide hosts approximately, uh, or run, there are 477 events per year in the City of Adelaide, of which there's over two and a half million attendees. Um, and of these people, the attendees um, that fill in various um, surveys, over 90% of those surveyed, uh, and at our own event, which was New Year's Eve, um, were supportive of sustainability in events. Um, and believed that the perception of sustainability at these events uh, is important and rising. So we really should be supporting this. I'd also draw uh, the Chamber's attention to the fact that um, it's estimated that 8 million tonnes of plastic waste enters the ocean every year, and it takes more than 400 years for PET bottles to break down and the plastics themselves. Plastic straws are one of the top 10 most common items found on shores during international coastal cleanups. And Australians are using an average of something like 10 million straws <coughs> a day, which is just extraordinary. Um, there are many alternatives to plastic straws. Um, there are compostable uh, straws. There are straws, my favourite, of course, is made out of spaghetti. There are bamboo straws. There are glass straws. There are... Um, Metal, yeah, there are metal straws actually, um, and uh, in fact, uh, in many other countries, you can't actually use uh, plastic straws, and there are paper straws. Um, so I would uh, ask that um, the chamber support this motion that we actually can ban the use of single uh, single use plastic straws at our own events, and also work with all new licences in our parklands effective of as of the first of January. Thank you, DLM. Your motion was seconded by Councillor Hender. Councillor Hender, you wish to speak to the matter? Reserving, Reserving your right. Councillor Antic had hand up next. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I propose an amendment. Um, I can get up, I'll do. Um, and it's in front of you there. I'll read it out for the benefit of someone. Uh, um, the, uh, that council provide a report in relation to the cost and utility of banning the use of plastic straws in council operations and council run events, including but not limited to the cost of the ratepayer, the cost of businesses, and the realistic impact on the local environment and the impact upon persons with disabilities. Seek a seconder. <coughs> Councillor Moran is your seconder. Floor is yours, I can make it through without coughing. I'll, I'll address that. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, look, this is one of the... I, it, might, it shouldn't surprise you, but it might, that um, the plight of sustainability and recycling is not something which is far from the mind. Nobody wants to see the world polluted with plastics, single-use plastics. In fact, you know, recycling is a very meritorious thing. This is actually a, um, it's a recycled motion, actually. This started with former Senator Robert Sims, I believe, who, uh, who put it up in the paper from that very chair. So his, his spirit lives on, which is uh, probably not good. But anyway, um, putting that to one side, look, the reality of this is, Lord Mayor, we, we don't really know what the impact um, on on the environment is going to be. We heard, you know, conversations about eight million tonnes of plastic, and uh, I'm sure it won't be um, any surprise to all of the avid um, readers of the Australian newspaper in the room, and indeed followers of uh, Nick Cater from uh, the Menzies Research Institute, who wrote about this very topic today. In fact, quoted the Deputy Lord Mayor um, in in these terms, which was simply that the the, the reality of this is that of the twelve. Point seven million dollars, a million tons of plastic, which ends up in the ocean. Um, only a, a fraction of that can be attributed to this, and, and that's from countries like China, um, who, who, you know, don't have the waste management processes that we do. Um, you know, this is this is unfortunately not the magic bullet which solves the world's plastic problems in the ocean. Most of it is fishing nets, and if we're really interested in doing that, that's not something we can control. Of. That's unusual for us in this chamber. We do like to take on global issues. I understand, you know, and global issues, local, all that sort of stuff. But the reality of this is, what is the impact? I mean, what is the utility and what is the impact? And, um, you know, there is a, a glaring omission. That is that there are people in our community who do rely on these 
straws. And is this, if we, if we do put a ban as it's characterised in, in the motion uh, on these straws, what, what does that say in respect of the, uh, the DBA, the Disability um, Discrimination Act? I mean, you know, this is a genuine question. I mean, you know, paper straws turn to mush, metal straws get hot and they don't bend. Same with, you know, I mean, past straws are just nonsensical. I mean, some people do rely on these things. So, um, so look, the reality is that, um, you know, we, we, we do like to pick up a trendy issue. I understand that, we do it all the time. Um, but what's the cost? You, you know, we shouldn't be leading with these sorts of things without getting the real impact of what we're doing. Uh, it's not unreasonable to get a report uh, and we should find out what the cost and what the utility of doing this and whether it will actually have any discernible impact on the environment around us. Um, I would suspect the answer to that is that it would be negligible. But uh, if that's the case, that's fine. There's no issue. We can change these sorts of things by behavioural things. A lot of businesses in the United States now are taking the view that they will offer people the opportunity, but they'll change through broader mechanisms than our own, the, 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 the characteristics. And God knows if, if it means putting less plastic in the environment and turns out to be a good, cheap, cheap and simple thing, then fantastic. But, you know, we, we can't be cutting off our nose to spite our face. And ultimately, we can't be disadvantaging people who, who might actually require this. So. Thank you, Councillor. So, members, we are debating an amendment as moved by Councillor Antic, seconded by Councillor Moran. Councillor Moran, do you wish to speak to I it? I reserve my right. I now look to Councillor Corbell Moore. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I would like to um, support the um, original motion. Um, I, well, look, cigarette butts and plastic straws are the top pollutants. Um, with plastic straws, biggest pollutants in our waterways, with up to 1,000 pieces of debris occupying each kilometre of Australian coastline, according to statistics from the Australian Marine Debris Initiative database. And I moved a motion a while back about cigarette butts in the city and cleaning up cigarette butts. And to me, it, it, the top, they're the top two. And we have in our strategic plan involved, highlighted as part of our green pillar, to be a leader in environmental change. So I will support the previous and not the amendment. Councillor members, do I have any further debate about the amendment? Councillor Wilkinson. Um, yeah, no, I won't be able to support the amendment. I think the cost would be negligible. And I think whilst we're not God and it won't change the world, um, but everyone just has to do their bit that is within their remit. And council has a fair bit of respect in terms of events in the parklands. I went to the skating uh, at in Victoria Square recently, and my son went to put all of the paper plates and things into recycling. And there was actually nowhere to put the compostable plates and the compostable coffee cup that we'd got. Special, co there was nowhere to put that. So at an Adelaide City Council, you know. Uh, facilitated event. There was nowhere where my 11 year old son could put his paper. He was trying to do the right thing. But if it was at WOMAD, he would have put it in the green thing and would have gone into green waste. There was no such bin. And the yellow bin was only reserved for 10 cent deposit um, things. And then there was the landfill. So he then had to put the compostable coffee cups and the compostable paper plates into the landfill. So that's just, it's just another example of just how council can just alter its, um, use its remit to actually um, improve uh, um, the way things are done within our area. Thank you. Councillor, Councillor Abiyad. Just a quick question, Lord Mayor. I'm really interested in the part of the motion where it does talk about um, impact upon persons with disability. Um, and I wanted to ask a question of administration. Would we, uh, part of rolling this out, would we have any concessions around that? Because I did read um, online um, as um, Councillor Sims has been advocating for a position of his, of his return to council. There was a substantial amount of comments under his thread that were talking about potential impacts of people with persons with disabilities. So I'm quite interested to understand if, what is the research around that? How can we assist? Is there any concession? What's involved? If we know the answer. Seeing a question about former Councillor Sims. Claire, I think you got some comments. Um, through the presiding member, um, so just to take it back a step, we have been working with the event sector for a period of time to develop some sustainable event guidelines. 
Um, and one of the um, pilot projects that we have tested and trialled through that is in relation to um, reducing uh, plastics at events. Um, absolutely, we would want to consider um, all people's needs of people who do attend events in the parklands. And I would expect that we would be engaging with our access and inclusion panel uh, to make sure that um, we get their input and advice into making sure that we weren't disadvantaging any members of our community. Thank you. So, members, I don't see any further hands. Councillor Martin, you're debating the amendment. Yes, I am, Lord Mayor, and I'm not going to support the amendment. Um, I think Councillor Antic uh, correctly suggested that um, uh, in this world, it is important that we think globally and act locally. And uh, this small measure, which, which it's proposed that we reject, is but one step, a small step, um, uh, that commits this council to standing by the things which are in its strategic plan and which we have um, previously committed to. Um, it, it is a, a, a refutation of all of that, and therefore I will not be able to support it. And whether it was Councillor Sims, your good self, Lord Mayor, or Councillor Vashaw who proposed this, I will support it. My only regret, and uh, I'm sure Councillor Antic is relieved, is that it doesn't go further because uh, there is a whole heap of plastic that's ignored by this motion. That is the plastic in which takeaway uh, food is sold, the plastic that lines coffee cups. Um, we could go on and on. And all of it has a severe impact on not only uh, uh, waste that uh, ends up clogging up uh, the, the oceans and in the you know uh, drains and the like, it also has a substantial cost for us as a council. <coughs> so um, this is um, uh, anathema to me, and I, I really uh, urge members to reject this and to support the original. Thank you, members. Before I hand back to the mover of the amendment, I'll make a personal comment. I do not support the amendment, and I commend the Deputy Lord Mayor for long-term advocacy in terms of the reduction of single-use plastics, and I echo Councillor Wilkinson's comments, which I think were very found, well-founded. Councillor Antic. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Actually, the observation about what WOMAD have done actually highlights the point, which is that you know, by cutting these things down, giving people the option, um, you know, you can achieve a similar, if not better, result. Um, look, the the um, just to clarify a couple of points there. We're certainly not suggesting that this is not something we should do. Um, the issue is, quite frankly, that it's a question of whether or not um, we should be um, not leading with our chin and getting more information before we go down that path. The the, the motion, uh, the original motion, is a blanket ban, so that won't require the, the, the staff to do anything other than ban it. So, in the event that it is an issue for persons with disability. Uh, then you know that's too bad, isn't it? I mean, so that's what we're going down. So rather than you know, I know this chamber loves a report, loves an opportunity to hear more about uh, everything, except you know when it comes an issue like this, and it seems to be we just go in boots and all. And why wouldn't you? Because you might just save the planet. But anyway, um, we're not going to do that here. Uh, what we are going to do though is uh, is walk down the blind alley, and that's fine. Um, but let's uh, let's take the opportunity to get a report, find out what it's really about, find out whether it's worth doing, and find out how it will impact people with disabilities, which is really the issue. So uh, let's be able to support it. Thank you, Councillor. So members, you're voting on an amendment. Those in favour. Those against. The amendment is lost, which takes us back to the principal motion as moved by the Deputy Lord Mayor. For those that have not debated the principal motion, do I have any further debate? I don't. I take you back to the Deputy Lord Mayor to sum up. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I know that uh, my learned colleague doesn't believe in climate change, so it was no real surprise that he doesn't really want to support something that's in the area of environmental sustainability. Um, I think as a council, we need to take every opportunity to lead in this space. Um, all of us are responsible and these are small steps. I would ask administration to take into account um, councillor Antics. Thank you. I just won't blame it. Uh, Councillor Antics' um, concern around disability, which you just answered then, but if I could actually ask that you take that into consideration um, with the uh, uh, the operations coming into effect from the 1st of 
um, January. Um, we did actually take that, when I was working on the events, we did take that into consideration and there were options for that. Um, plus, we also um, consulted with uh, disability and access groups um, and I put in a call today uh, to Gail Mellis, who uh, leads the um, uh, disability action group um, around this and she also was happy with the motion. Um, I also spoke to our former colleague, Councillor Senator Sims. He was also very happy uh, around this motion. Um, it's something that, you know, is part of what we've discussed as an overall um, sustainability agenda for the Council. It is one step at a time and we need to do everything we can possibly do in this space uh, to make everything that was in our control sustainable. So, thank you very much. Members, I put the principal motion before you. Those in favour? Those against? Motion carries. Members, the next item is 15.8. Councillor Corbell Moore, motion on notice Salvation Army Whitmore Square Master Plan, page 125. Councillor? Thank you, Emma. Seek a seconder. You have a seconder from Councillor Wilkinson. The floor is yours. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, as part of our master planning process the administration has undertaken in consulting with the community. Um, it has come, become apparent that the Salvation Army um, on the southwestern corner of um, Whitmore Square have some interest in um, potentially redeveloping and um, expanding their services to the community. And my motion seeks for our, administra our administration to work closely together with the Salvation Army um, to have some discussions around service provision, um, future needs of clients and opportunities for us to um, potentially partner together to have, in whatever the future outcome is, a good interface between the public and private realm. Um, just to provide a little bit of information about the Salvos, and I'm sure we're all very familiar, they do have a substantial real estate holding in addition to their op shop, which is on the corner. They have the disused um, former accommodation facility, and they also have a um, sobering up unit. Um, they have supported accommodation facilities, which extend through to Gilbert Street. Um, they provide a lot of services to people in need around IT, lifestyle activities, um, money management, goal setting, orientation to the community and so on. Um, they are one of the major support service providers in the city in addition to the Hutt Street Centre. And we all know there's been a lot of media attention provided to the Hutt Street Centre of recent times, in particular around potential redevelopment opportunities of the Hutt Street Centre. Um, any discussions around the Salvos and their future intent strategically for their site on Whitmore Square is very much in isolation of any of that activity um, and it really has come to the fore as a result of our um, consultation process with the community. The Salvation, I have spoken to the CEO of the Salvation Army, um, Barry Casey, and he has indicated that over the last 18 months they have um, had initiated some discussions with council, but that they haven't necessarily progressed in the same in the way that they would have liked them to. So this motion seeks for our administration to directly work together closely with the salvos, and they are very open to um, opportunities, which are for that site, in addition to potentially moving to other sites as well. Um, so I seek your support in this. Um, it is a very important issue. It's a very complex issue. Um, we still have, um, according to our Connections Week data, 143 people sleeping rough, homeless in our city um, every night. So there are some alarming statistics and um, our city does consider itself to be a welcoming city as part of its DNA. And we do need to be an advocate in this area. We have opportunities um, in particular around our new state government. And I do foreshadow the next council meeting that I'll be moving a motion in relation to um, city council providing some advocacy for um, support services and capital funding. Thank you, Councillor. And your motion was seconded by Councillor Wilkinson. Do you wish to speak to this matter, Councillor Wilkinson? Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Corbell, for the motion. Um, I'm familiar with this building. It's a multi-storey building behind the Salvo shop on Whitmore Square. That is, uh, it was former accommodation. For some reason, it's gone into disuse. We do have a homeless, you know, issues in in the city. 
there's a building there that was used for that purpose that could be you know refurbished and reused for that building for a relatively um, you know small cost for, for the government it could directly affect and improve the, the homelessness situation in Adelaide. It also has the potential to help the situation, I think, in, in Hutt Street by taking some of the pressure off Hutt Street. Um, and I note that the previous government uh, put the Salvation Army Women's Hostel on Angus Street onto the market, and it's still on the market. So there was a purpose-built women's shelter built in 1915, you know, bedrooms for and that then that building's just being sold, I know, because I've looked at it with developer clients of mine. But but that that you know, there's another opportunity sort of gone gone begging. Uh, that's just being sold on the open market. But here there's an opportunity, I think. Uh, so I think that's the Bell for the motion. I think it's a great opportunity. And it's also in a part of town where the impact there is um, you know, there's a, it's opposite sort of other commercial premises and stuff on Morford Street, so it's sort of not right on top of other people's houses in that particular location. So I think it's as good as anywhere uh, and as a purpose built building that can be used economically. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any further debate on this matter, members? Back to the mover, Councillor Corbell Mortison. Summed up. Members, I put this item before you. Those in favour? Those against? Carried. Item 15. Eight. Members, item 15.9, which was a motion of notice from Councillor Martin. Are you looking to proceed with this, Councillor? No. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Members, I now look to motions without notice. Councillor Abiyad. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, and I'll move the uh, motion without notice in regards to Small Business Friendly Council, and I'll seek a second, Lord Mayor. Okay, remember that motion is on your screens. Moved by council, seconded by Councillor Wilkinson. The floor is yours, Councillor Abia. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Look, uh, I have first um, have had an encounter with this Lord Mayor on the 5th of June with you at three o'clock, uh, when we've had the pleasure of uh, receiving the Small Business Commissioner, John Chapman, um, at your office to have a discussion around this initiative. Uh, I think it's fantastic that uh, we are seeing leadership in that sector uh, from the Commissioner and I think it's fantastic that we're seeing councils as well uh, in that regard subscribe to this model. Uh, I think the exciting thing about it is around consistency, uh, which also provides for small business operation, um, the ability to be able to go to any council in South Australia and be able to at least um, receive a similar level of service or a similar level of expectation uh, around what this will do from a small business friendly uh, perspective. Um, I think that consistency, consistency is really important, especially when we're looking at 68 councils across South Australia. To receive that same level of service and the same level of engagement, I think through that process is great. Um, we've also noted, and you have Lord Mayor on many occasions, that the backbone of our city is small business. Uh, and it is our bread and butter. So in essence, if there's anything we could do um, in consultation, we're able also to feed back to the Commission and get involved in that perspective it would be pretty important um, because there'll be things that would work for us and work for others that may not work for other councils as well. So with, um, like I said, this is very straightforward. It's something that the administration can really take on board, uh, embrace, facilitate and hopefully market um, as a, uh, a business-friendly uh, city of Adelaide. Uh, that would be an incredible piece of work uh, and an added benefit for our city and also for our residents. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Wilkinson, you seconded. Do you wish to speak to the matter? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Councillor Abiad, for this uh, initiative and, and for our deputy. Um, as a small business owner employing two or three people, I understand um, the sort of issues that arise and, and the deputation uh, talked about, you know, local governments having a policy of paying small businesses on time and I know what it's like when you're waiting on perhaps a government uh, client to pay you so that you can pay your wages on the 15th of the month and if that doesn't come through on the 15th then you can't cover your wages and that's the sort of thing that that's my reality so I completely understand the sort of issues and support the motion. Thank you councillor members do I have any further debate on this matter councillor Abiyad back to you. Lord Mayor summed up. Members, I put this matter before you. Those in favour? Those against? We've carried item 15.9. Thank you, members. Thank you, the Small Business Commissioner. Members, uh, that was item 16, my mistake. Thank you. Uh, members, now we have a number of matters to contemplate in confidence, so I will need a number of motions, if I could, please. So 18.1.1, Appler advice. Can I have a mover, please? Councillor Moran, seconded by. Councillor Corbell Moore, I'll put that straight before you, members. Those in favour? 
Those against carried. Item 18.2.1, Brown Hill Gazette Creek Stormwater Board, moved by Deputy Lord Mayor, seconded by Councillor Clarehan. I'll put it straight to the floor. Those in favour? Those against, we carry. 18.2.1. Are these exclusion motions allowed to be put on the box? No, I can't. I had asked that question previously, uh, Councillor. Thank you. Very logical question. 18.2.2, Benarfin Park EOI results. Can I have a mover, please? Councillor Wilkinson, seconded by Councillor Corbyn Moore. I'll put that straight before you. Those in favour? Those against? Carried. 18.2.3, strategic property investigation. A mover, please. Councillor Corbell Moore, seconded by the DLM. I'll put it before you. Those in favour? Those against? Carried. 18.2.4, appointment of board members to RMMA. Can I have a mover? Councillor Clarahan, seconded by Councillor Abiyad. All those in favour? Those against? Carried. 18.2.5, draft North Adelaide Golf Course Master Plan for consultation. Moved by Councillor Wilkinson, seconded by the DLM. Straight to the floor. Those in favour? Those against? Carried. 18.2.6, Capital City Committee update. Can I have a mover? DLM, seconded by Councillor Clarahan. Straight to the floor. Those in favour? Those against? Carried. And members, the two other items, which will be additional items, 18.2.7, which will be a briefing or an update from the CEO with regards to a major events matter. Can I have a mover, please? Councillor Clarahan, seconded by. Councillor Wilkinson, straight to the floor. Those in favour? Those against carried 18.2.8 a liquor licensing matter to be debated or update, updated in confidence. Moved by Councillor Wilkinson, seconded by Councillor Clarahan. Straight to the floor. Those in favour? Those against carried. So, members, thank you. Um, any members of the gallery who are not uh, associated with any of those matters to be debated in confidence, can I please ask you to leave the chamber and thank you for your attendance? Thank you, Deputy. Thank you, Commissioner.
Members, I declare this meeting formally closed at 9.40 p.m. on Tuesday the 24th of July. I thank you for your participation. Meeting closed.